It's two o'clock and this meeting will come to order. First thing is roll call and all of our trustees are here. Our attorney is here and our treasurer will show up in a little bit. Uh, so then next we have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we will have public comment. Speakers, please state your name and community and speak for no more than three minutes. Persons addressing the board are expected to observe a level of civility and decorum appropriate for a public meeting. No personal attacks or disruptions from audience members. Please, mm -hmm. um, we have a list. Okay. All right, so first up we have Leslie Wild. Good afternoon, I'm Leslie Wild from Caden, Idaho. For 36 years, I was an elementary school teacher, grades two, three, and four. I know how important it is for parents, teachers, and oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I can hear myself. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Leslie Wild from Hayden, Idaho. For 36 years, I was an elementary school teacher, grades two, three, and four. I know how important it is for parents, teachers, and librarians to work together to bring literacy and most importantly, a love of learning to our children. Parents, teachers, librarians, and trustees need to be a team working together. I noticed an item in today's agenda, youth services. I'd like to take a moment to share my own experiences with youth services at our libraries. From a grandmother's perspective, I began taking my twin grandchildren to the Hayden Library when they were preschoolers. The programs were fun, varied, and child-centered. Music and art appealed to my little granddaughter. Lego and building things turned on my grandson. They both absorbed the fun of stories. Books became their friends. I always remember the day we walked up to the door of the library hand in hand, and my little granddaughter said, Grammy, I love the library. That love of learning and books has followed them into high school as juniors, A students taking AP courses. Librarians have supported and, and encouraged them all along the way. They love books. I also noticed the library outreach program on today's agenda. Because I'm still a mobile senior, I haven't so far had the opportunity to use this community service. But I've often heard seniors in our communities express appreciation for the books brought to their assisted living centers. These seniors talk about how the bookmobile is their primary source of reading materials, how the librarian will go out of her way to bring books on topics or specific authors that interest them. Feeling isolated, they don't take it for granted that books are still a part of their lives. Lastly, on the agenda is the important topic of membership in the American Library Association. Professionals need professional support. Teachers need opportunities for lifelong learning. They take continued learning classes throughout their careers. Doctors, dentists, lawyers, real estate brokers, all professionals need to continue learning, share ideas with their peers, be rejuvenated to bring their very best back to the communities that they serve. Librarians too need the support and opportunities to grow offered by their professional organization. I'd like the trustees to explain to us how dropping membership in the ALA will improve the services librarians provide for our communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, next we have Michelle Lipper. Chair Otteson, Director Eccles, and Trustees. My name is Michelle Lippard. I'm a resident of Post Falls and a member of the CLN Alliance. I brought a book today, To Tocqueville's Democracy in America. 
Published in 1835, it is a, considered a classic in political philosophy. De Tocqueville, Frenchman, traveled to the U.S. in 1831 to see how the great American experiment in democracy was working. He was deeply impressed, but he also had some concerns. One of those concerns was what he called the tyranny of the majority. Since democracy is predicated on the idea that the majority rules, could the majority abuse their power? To Tocqueville believed that that was highly possible and could have devastating impacts on both minorities and the American commitment to equality. To Tocqueville was fearful that an impotent, um, powerful majority could result in less independence of thought and freedom of the mind. It strikes me that this board is in danger of becoming a tyrannical majority. You seek to disassociate from the ALA because their director is a lesbian and because they promote books with LGBTQ themes. The LGBTQ community is one of those minority communities that could be crushed. Your discussion on the policy of the selection of materials suggests that books would be selected based on dominant community values. There is no room for intellectual freedom. In the absence of this, the whole community suffers. The strength of America is not found in imposed conformity, but rather in diverse free thought. This is a value to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Suzanne Kearney. I'm Suzanne Kearney and I live in Post Falls. Let me begin with an analogy. I'm here to protest fences around swimming pools. Every child has a constitutional right to swim, and fencing a pool is the literal equivalent of swim banning. Fences are hateful structures that deny children equal access to the beneficial activity of swimming. Every taxpayer-funded pool should represent the values of the community, swimmers and non-swimmers alike. Pools should be left open to children and access points clearly displayed. This is particularly the case when kids are out of school but parents still at work. Any working parent whose child enters the open swimming area and drowns should be shamed and labeled a bad parent. If the county sheriff happens to make a public statement that fences around pools are actually the law, he should be accused of political posturing and buried in ad hominem attacks. Never mind the statistics about open pools being harmful to children. We all know that taxpayer funded pools have an exemption from liability for any child who drowns. And this exemption, of course, means that drowning is not actually harmful. In fact, many children have benefited from near drowning experiences, and because of this, they now know when they are, quote, ready to swim. Any parent or community member who disagrees is a far-right extremist who wants to take away kids' rights and turn our community into an authoritarian police state. So, as you can see, we should do away with all fences around swimming pools for the good of our children and community. CLN's quote, fence, the minor card policy, may be good for optics, but closer examination reveals that the gate has been left unlocked. If you truly want to protect children and put parents fully in charge, here are some suggestions. First, the minor card should be the default option for every child. Existing cards should be transitioned and all new cards should be restricted unless a parent opts out. Next, parents should be fully informed before giving their child an unrestricted card. I suggest the application contain the exact text of Idaho Code 18-1515 with a statement such as the following, quote, the minor sections may contain materials which violate this code, but the library is exempt from any liability for any harm a minor may incur while accessing such materials, end quote. I dare you to include text and images from some of the books in question, which you can access at cleanbooksforkids.com. 
Finally, any and all materials that may violate Idaho code should be moved to the adult section and for goodness sake, taken off of display. An open fence is no fence at all. Please lock it up and give the key to the parents alone. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Teresa Burkett. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa and I live in Post Falls. I'm a member of the CLN Alliance, which advocates for our libraries. I have several comments to make. First, Mr. Hanley, you encourage the public in your letter to the editor to share our input. Well, here it goes. Are you aware that in your job description, it states that you are to represent the network to the public? You failed by taking the side of the sheriff and calling books in the collection sewage by accepting the practice of stealing books. Your job is also to articulate net the network's mission to promote wide ownership. You failed. Your job is to communicate effectively. Instead, you stated that these materials endanger minors. Do you have any data that states these books endanger minors or any books in the collection? Two, the proposed changes to the material selection policy eliminate an intellectual freedom. Books open our minds to daydream, to history, to worldly experiences, and to other cultures. We don't have to agree with an author or force someone to read it, but all books should be available to the public who can decide what is best for them and their family. However, you are stating you don't trust the public to make those choices, so you're going to make those decisions for them. I'm sure you don't like government control in your life, but this is exactly what you're doing in mine. You are taking away my freedom to think for myself, the right to read freely and without retribution. By the way, as part of your job description, this board is, serves as advocates for intellectual freedom and to have knowledge of the principles of intellectual freedom. You are failing. According to the ACLU, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution protects the freedom of speech and expression against all levels of government censorship. Mr. Boyles, I do hope you express our freedom of speech when discussing the First Amendment with this board because you, you stated it when you were hired. Number three, the ALA resolution. This board is lying to the public. Do you really think we could create the, you could create the ALA resolution stating it's for financial decision when clearly Ms. Audison stated it's because of the ALA president and her stance on the LGBTQ community by saying, queer the catalog, queer the library. Attempting to use this language is an embarrassment and shouldn't be used as justification for attempting to force your beliefs on the community. In closing, I will say, you are doing a disservice to this library and the community by changing the material selection policy and eliminating, eliminating the ALA. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Heather Greenman. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank the uh, majority board for making the motion to separate from the ALA. Thank you. And I think that that was a common sense thing to do. I've heard some comments about how it's because the lady's a lesbian. Uh, but really, the reason why, from what I understand, is because she is a Marxist who has Marxist ideology and was voted in by a majority of Marxist people. It was like 40,000 people. And I couldn't quite comprehend why it was such a big deal to separate from the ALA when there's other um, organizations that the library can use for resources. I understand resources are something that the library needs. However, if the leader of the ALA had been a Nazi white supremacist, Nobody would be protesting that. And if she was voted in by a bunch of people who thought Nazi white supremacy was OK, it wouldn't be a big deal. So I don't understand what the difference is, because anybody who knows history knows that communism has killed over 100 million people. So thank you for doing that. My second thing, um, we are a constitutional republic. We are not a democracy. That is why in our country we have so much diversity. You can go across the border to Washington. If you don't like Idaho, that's why you have diversity. A constitutional republic provides that. Democracy is mob rule. 
our founding fathers studied very much our government before they made it, and that's why they decided not to have a democracy. So I think that you are representing the people the way you're supposed to, according to our constitutional republic. Um, also, um, Ken Ham came to speak at Candlelight this week in church, um, and I have a discount thing that I got from the conference. It's uh, for a super library pack. It looks like it's about 21 books for adults and children. Those of you who don't know who Ken Ham is, he's a scientist. He's a creation scientist. And I think that um, since the library is all about representing all views, um, I see no reason why the library wouldn't be able to accept this purchase. Um, the discount, uh, basically, it's it's uh, over a hundred dollar discount on the set. So I want to let you know that I'm going to be putting that in and that I have the um, coupon code for the discount on the purchase. Uh, Ken Ham is somebody who really changed, helped change my worldview. I used to believe in evolution till I was introduced to um, creation science. And I found that there's a lot of holes in evolution and creation science offer, uh, answers that. And also when I was in college, I studied um, quantum physics and quantum physics goes a lot along with creation science. So it's definitely a very viable science. And I believe that that viewpoint should be given to people in our community, adults and children alike. So thanks for all the good work you're doing, you guys. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Next, we have Regina McCree. I guess my name is Regina McCree. I live in Post Falls, trustees, Director Eccles, and staff. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm here to talk about the material selection policy. As you, in your role as government officials, you must be transparent with the public and give the public notice and opportunity to respond. With respect to this policy, I think it's, it's incumbent upon you to say what you are changing and why. And it's been very difficult to determine from what has been provided to the public what you actually are changing. Um, during my tenure on the board, I mentioned that as a public entity, the library cannot engage in viewpoint or content discrimination. I never took the position, and neither did any other trustee, that the collection cannot be curated by age group and age appropriateness of the subject matter. It appears. Although, as I said, it's not clear that the proposed changes to the material selection policy um, is going to burden the First Amendment rights mm -hmm. of adults. You're not just looking at age appropriateness for minors, but you intend to implement changes that will affect adults. I know you're already going to be uh, tutored on the First Amendment by your counsel during this meeting, but I thought it would be helpful to read to you the thoughts of Justice Brandeis. From 1927, he is a U.S. Supreme Court justice, or obviously he was, and here's his description of the First Amendment. Those who won our independence believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties, and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They believed that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth, that without free speech and discussion, that is futile, that with them discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, that this should be a fundamental principle of American government. They recognize the risks to which all human institutions are subject, that order cannot be secured merely through fear of punishment, that it is hazardous to discourage thought, hope, and imagination, that fear breeds repression, and that repression breeds hate, and that hate menaces stable government. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Teresa Bornfeld. Hello, my name is Dr. Teresa Bornpool, and I am a resident of Post Falls. Um, I've been noticing a pattern throughout Cooney County on boards specifically that have a majority of individuals who were endorsed by the KCRCC. Um, 
organizations are severing from their national counterparts or from just their general counterparts. We've seen that in Lakeland um, with the school board separating from the Idaho School Board Association. We've seen that at North Idaho College where trustees are trying their darndest to separate from the Northwest Commission on Universities <laughs> and Colleges. And now the Community Library Network is working to separate from the American Library Association. So why do we have these organizations? Why do we affiliate with them in general? Um, many reasons. Access to um, expensive resources, um, information with the most up-to-date research, national benchmark data, which is so important to understand where we lay in the, in the schematics, and just generally best practices for how to run the best libraries, because that's what our taxpayers deserve. So I asked myself, why would a lay board make such a big decision when library professionals are saying, no, 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 this is actually really important for us. This is how we utilize these resources. And it made me think about um, isolationism and abusive relationships and how um, in abusive relationships, partners will separate their partners from their friends, separate them from their families and their loved ones. Because without resources and without sounding boards, and without perspective, the abuser doesn't recognize how much trouble they're in. The abuse is left without hope. They're left without resources. And I see that exactly happening here. And some of you might be looking at me saying, Teresa, Teresa, that's absolutely crazy. Um, we're not abusers. We just know better. Um, and isn't that what the abuser would say? Thank you. Next, we have Evan Coach. Well, good afternoon. I didn't sign up to make a public comment, but as long as you pass me the microphone, I'm one of those people who can't can't resist. I am constantly reminded of the fact that um, I'm older than most of you guys, and I'm old enough to remember the days when when Elvis Presley showed his, was shown on um, the Ed Sullivan show, but only from the waist up because it was deemed by authorities, somewhat like yourselves, that because he was swiveling his hips, he could sexualize young people, particularly young girls, and society just didn't want that to happen. Well, we all know that in the years following that, society has accepted rock and roll and is and looks on Elvis Presley as a national hero. Um, that's not to say that, that rock and roll hasn't maybe become a little too sexualized and, um, and couldn't do a better job of protecting public morals. After all, we don't all support the whole idea of sex, drugs, and rock and roll music. But my point is that um, society is kind of ahead of where you guys are right now. We accept LGBTQ people. We accept books that talk about um, sex in an open, frank manner because we know that it, it helps to create healthy lives when these kids become adults. Thank you, and I, um, I, I applaud you for struggling with this question, and I have um, great hope that you'll come to a, a conclusion that, that respects the needs of all our citizens in Kootenai County. Right. Uh, thank you, and I apologize if you didn't sign up. Someone, someone put your name on here. Um, anyway, of course you. Uh, anyway, so our last speaker will be Pat Raffi. I'm Pat Raffi. I also live in Post Falls, and I have feedback for trustees on your stewardship. Ms. Blank. Ms. Robinson, thank you for always actively listening to public input and making well-reasoned decisions. During recent budget negotiations, you tried to begin paying library staff wages closer to market. You sought to protect facilities funding and to increase the materials budget. You expressed concerns about service cuts just to offset dramatic legal fee increases. You are always consistently graceful Despite recent pressures, I appreciate your care for all of CLN's resources. Ms. Allison, 
Stewardship is a biblical precept, often applied to the way people are treated. How did you reconcile stewardship in this biblical context when you, Mr. Ploss and Mr. Hanley, were untruthful with Ms. Robinson regarding board leadership changes back in June? Despite having worked with Ms. Robinson and Ms. Blank for two years, you deliberately dishonored them. As chair, you don't intervene when Mr. Ploss and Mr. Hanley threaten staff. You don't seem to notice when they insult other trustees. Please hold yourself to higher standards of stewardship, Madam Chair. Mr. Ploss. You remain uninformed about libraries. You're still regularly confused about CLN financials. So of course it's difficult for you to be a good steward. In your role as clerk, you don't seek facts from the experts on taxes or urban, urban renewal. Protecting CLN doesn't seem nearly as high a priority as your biases and partisanship. And finally, sir, your behavior toward the director and the staff sure looks like harassment from the audience. Please stop bullying women in our libraries, Mr. Ploss. Mr. Hanley, even after learning that accepting Post Falls Urban Renewal Agency closure funds would not increase future property taxes, you deliberately undercut CLN funding again. You threatened staff with a very crude comment, quote, heads will roll, unquote. You showed your immorality and your contempt for your role as trustee when you publicly agreed with Sheriff Norris's theft of CLN materials. That betrayal was particularly vile, sir. In closing, I again appreciate the stewardship exhibited by trustees Blank and Robinson. Both women protect CLN and both always act ethically. Okay. Thank you. That concludes our public comments. Uh, next, we'll go to the consent agenda. Uh, do you have corrections? One thing. Um, the September 27th. I'm not sure how this is done, uh, but no. Oh, okay, never mind. I see it on roll call. I thought my name wasn't there because, and then it said that I left early. But I see that's not it. Never mind. Good. <laughs> All right. That's a pause. I, I have uh, three of the minutes. I'd like to make a correction to you. the twenty seventh. 28th and 29th. On the 27th, the uh, last sentence of the main paragraph of discussion, it says Eccles will be available via telecommunications on the 29th. I think that was very clear. She was saying she would not be. And I'd like to change that to the way it was stated. Or summary of stated Eccles stated she will be gone on the 29th and not available to meet. My recollection was that I did state that I would be available via telecommunication. Yeah, that's why we had. I went around four times on the pre on the next meeting, but. She said she would not be in any kind of reliable communications. I think it's just simply she would not be available to be. So perhaps the it would be better. Uh, Eccles might be available. I think it was very clear she would be gone on the 29th. And it, you could say it would be. Couldn't count on her being available. Uh, Trustee Blank. Uh, perhaps the staff could look at the video again and be, you know, very clear about um, what happened that day, rather than us trying to. Yeah, that's fine. 
Go, go ahead. I was going to change the dates. I was just going to suggest if, if if that was correct, it could possibly be rewritten. Maybe it could be Echo stated she would be gone and might be available via telecommunications okay. as a suggested change. But I again, unless someone listens back at the recording, that's I fine. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Robinson, um, if we if we could actually come up with an agreement on what to say there, that would be great because I would hate to have staff that's already overwhelmed with certain things um, look back just for the sentence. I would think we could come up with a, a sentence that hopefully the director and the trustees could accept. Yeah, what Trustee Hanley said is fine with me. Is it I wouldn't? Is the library director comfortable with that interpretation? I, I'll, yep. read, I'll read it back if that sounds okay. Um, My recollection was that I may not have video conferencing, but I confirmed that I would have telecommunications ability. Right, that's fine. That is also mine. So well, that's specifically not mine. I'm going to bring it up because she said over and over she, we couldn't have a meeting that day because she couldn't wouldn't be in touch. Mm -hmm. We even our council legal counsel said you could do it by phone call and. She insisted she wouldn't be reliably available. Trustee Blank? This feels a little bit like it might be attacking the director. That's why I would really like us. I'm sorry that I am asking for um, more work for the staff, but I just really like it to be whatever is on the video, put it in the minutes, you know, and and we'll call it good. I, I do not want it put in there. That the director was saying saying something you know my recollection is she said she would be available by telecommunication um as a recommendation would, we could maybe take this one off the consent agenda and bring it back to the next regular meeting and i can send out the timestamp on the meeting video when we were discussing that item for everyone's review all right so we need a consensus on taking it off the consent agenda okay so we have consensus I'm, I'm for taking it off the consent agenda and bringing it back later. Um, we have a, a third person. I, I, I think it's very petty and um, I don't think it's necessary. Okay, um, Trustee Blank, you said that that was fine. So we have consensus. All right, so we are taking the minutes of the special meeting of September 27th off of the consent agenda and bringing it back at a later time. Um, do we have further corrections? On the 28th, I believe that's the one that I watched. There was no sound or recording on, on the recording. I don't know if that was ever said. Um, so in the main paragraph, two thirds of the way down under discussion, liability insurance, uh, says Plus and Handley wanted want another comprehensive plan to review before binding the policy. I'd like to change that from plan to policy quote. We were talking about the quotes for the policy, not some kind of plan. A comprehensive policy quote to review before binding the policy. Your changes and my other one was on the 29th on the top of the second page um second sentence or third sentence a consensus was reached for the insurance brokers to continue comprehensive insurance quote um that was not what we said i went back and looked at the video uh consensus was reached and strike the rest of that and replace it with that the library director continued to work with insurance brokers to obtain full coverage insurance quote. That the library director continued to work with insurance brokers to obtain a full coverage insurance quote. And the 
whole discussion right then was we don't have full coverage. Yes, we're signing up strike term, but we don't have full coverage. We may never get it. And Chair Audison actually says in the video, some or she says uh, we wouldn't want someone to stop the quoting process or something to that effect. Right. Um, so that's we, that's what we, we were have... trying to do. It's more than what's written there. Okay. We would recommend that that also be moved off the consent agenda for people to review if there is video we found. Okay. I'd put that. I don't think that's necessary. But it just verifies it. It just verifies it. I mean, if the director has asked that, it just verifies it. Yeah, I think anything that's uh, that isn't just like an easy accept no. that that it's moved off the. So do we have a uh, consensus on that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Do we have a stream of that consent agenda? Right, so we uh, may not have a timer anymore. Why is that? Our staff is very busy today, so we don't have additional timers. We have the timer for the uh, public comment, and the board will have to keep track of their own time. Okay, that, that can be a little distracting from the sure. conversation. I'll, I'll do the timer. Excuse me. Okay. Do you want two minutes per trustee? No, no, we're just retaining. Oh. Um, the sections. So right now, I think we have okay. like one minute left. Um, Trustee Henley. So was this a temporary loss of our timekeeper? Um, currently, our timekeeper is part time, and they do have other responsibilities that they need to do. Um, on occasion, our assistant director will step in and be timekeeper, uh, but that is not available today. Trustee Henley. We have a staff member in the audience. Um, I move that we accept the consent agenda with um, the uh, minutes of the special meeting of September 27th and the minutes of the special meeting of September 29th to be uh, taken off uh, and uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm thinking about you having to repeat this, and I'm like, Bleh. Um, anyway, <laughs> with the exception of the minutes of the uh, 27th and the 29th. Okay, it has been moved to accept the consent agenda without the minutes of the uh, September 27th and September 29th uh, minutes in there. All those in favor? I think we need discussion. Oh. Okay, uh, Trustee Fox. So the consent agenda, oh, oh, it's the CIN financial statement and the minutes. It doesn't include these other statistics. Right. Just and we, don't have, and we don't have any choice but to accept the CIN. It's just the, the CIN uh, financial statements and the minutes are there for informational purposes, and that is very um appropriate for a consent agenda to be for it to include informational things only. Professor Robinson. And just a reminder to all trustees that it is now uh, marked unaudited on the CIN, which was a good idea. So we are uh, approving it, but it's not, it, it shows it's unaudited. Okay, um, and I will be voting. Um, I will be voting uh, no on accepting the consent agenda because I found uh, page three on September 8th. Uh, a lot of it was just confusing and um, but anyway, but do we have any further discussion on that? Okay, all those in favor of accepting the consent agenda uh, minus the minutes from September 27th and September 29th, say aye. 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 Try. Uh, can we have discussion? You brought up that about September 8th. Want to um, remove that one? I think we. It's, uh, no, I'm just not. I'm going to vote okay. against because it's confusing and we need to move on. So, um, so we had three or four eyes. 
Aye. Aye. And I am voting no. So then we will move on to the Community Library Network September 2023 financial statements. We have discussion or correction on that? Or mm -hmm. questions, Trustee Henry? I had a question regarding the uh, telecom. Um, obviously, it's a budget for $88,000. And which line? So it's line number 33. And it's come in, which is nice, but it's come in uh, significantly under budget. It was a budget, it appears to be for $88,730, and we've spent $28,443. So I was just curious what happened. We only spent one third of what was a lot. I'm not complaining as much as just want to understand what that was for. Or, or what transpired there. Staff, I can't do that. When we budget the telecommunications and internet lines, we have to budget without knowing that we are going to get E-rate. Um, the end, the last quarter of the year, because we haven't even applied for that yet, nor do we budget for receiving any monies from the state covering our non e rate portions, because the state can decide to not give that at the drop of a hat. Yes. I have a couple of questions on finance. Um, number two, bond levy zero and i read in the comment under bond levy on the first page law requires all tax money go to the bond until the income line is reached 100 percent we've received property tax income to satisfy our bond levy so i guess am i to understand that taxpayers are paying still late taxes to the bond and it doesn't go to the bond I guess staff would please answer that. If you look at the year to date column for the bond levy, it has been satisfied. Any tax monies that come um, through the year have to be applied to the bond first. So when you get October's financials, you'll notice that money goes to the bond and not to the property tax line. Does that make sense? No. Um, you're saying the first two hundred and $274,000 that comes from the treasurer goes 100% by law to the bond, to the bond, even though taxpayers are paying it for property taxes, because there's two line items on your property tax bond. Right. And so you're saying all, okay, anyway, maybe the, the receipts that I get from the treasurer on payment just says it is for property taxes and it says what year they're from so it doesn't tell me that oh of this portion of their property taxes it was bond and this wasn't it doesn't come that way which is why when we get any money at the beginning of the year it gets applied to the bond first actually Trustee Pamling is next. Uh, just one other question. Uh, on line item number 44, that was the repairs and maintenance for uh, Princess Harrison there. Uh, what, whatever happened, I'm curious, what were the findings from the engineering firm regarding water leaching down, down the mountain? I know there was an issue. And I'm glad to see we were way under budget on that particular location for facilities, but uh, is that is that still being studied or did we get a price or what what happened with that okay we currently have received from the architect uh, a schematic for the handicap path um, for ada compliance but we have not received any information relating to the engineering and soil survey and all of those structural type of aspects thank you all right trustee blank um since this is our well, it, it probably isn't the final one. We'll have an adjusted one, but since this is the end of the year, I look at the um, right-hand column, particularly for expenses, and look at where we are over considerably. There are con there are a number of items where we're over where we're over, and I understand why. Um, 
but I would like some clarity um, on in and I and when we're over on a mall, like we've budgeted two hundred and fifty dollars for bank service charges, and we're over a hundred and we're at one hundred and four percent. But I don't care at a you know um, because it's only, the budget was only two for two hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, it isn't that I don't care. It is that 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 is a that's an insignificant dollar amount. But I'm concerned about our legal and professional line. And I I looked at the explanation. And so I'm assuming because where there are a lot of that, so it was a this month it was for a payroll, a timekeeping payroll system. Collect collect okay, legal legal consulting, architect fees for the water issue. And so what was the biggest about? I mean, what were the what were the biggest things that happened? Because we that we ended up in that line paying forty three thousand dollars over budget, uh, almost forty four thousand dollars over budget. And so I was concerned about what those. Well, that's forty three thousand dollars over. Yeah, I was concerned about what they were. Okay, and could you answer that concisely? And sure. Clarify? The two largest items um, were the consultant, Jim Garcia. Remember, there was expenditures relating to the hiring of the new director and, and additional work that she did for the district. And then the other line item, um, I'll talk about a little bit later, but historically we've paid about $3,000, $4,000 for legal fees. And this past year we spent $47,000. Okay, that was um, of concern to me. Also, I would like to say that um, although I know that this has limited time on here, looking at our financial reports and ta being able to talk about them thoroughly is one of the most important tasks that we're um, that that is in our job description and legal job description in Idaho code. So I would hope that we would be given time to go over what we need to go over for these. Oh. Um, um. Actually, Chesty, last. Oh, so, did you have something? A real, real quick one, and it's, I guess, maybe number seven, URD closed. Why is there a difference between what we received in year to date actual? I thought there was one check that came in at 42,300 for current month and 43,270 for. Okay. Uh, does it measure yourself? For a minute. Prior districts that have closed, there is still um, monies that have come in via late taxes that are noted to be for the URD. And so throughout the course of the year, we've had little dribbles of, of money um, come in. But for September, that amount is for the closing of the two post balls URDs. Okay, if there is. No further discussion. I am going to entertain a motion to accept the community library network. Uh, I move that we accept the community library network financial statements for September 2023. Okay, it has been moved to accept the community library network financial statements for September 2023. Discussion on that or okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, sounds like it was unanimous. The Community Library Network financial statements for September 2023 have been accepted. Next, we will go to circulation statistics. Uh, Trustee Class? Um, I've asked like two months in a row, and I still don't have it here, but for new patrons, I would like to know how many people get dropped. So we're we're always all all the reports are showing how many new cards are issued, how many new patrons. But I know they go off the roll every month because mine did when I went to use it. Mine had expired. So can we add that? How many each month disappear? Uh, do we have any consensus on that? Why? because it's the difference between the two is our growth. We have no tracking of growth of patrons. Trustee Helen? 
Is, is that a difficult uh, metric to collect? Reckon? No, um, we usually report that annually. Um, and so the growth is looked at usually in the field of libraries um, annually. Uh, you can look at it on a, a monthly basis. We, we can include them. Um, I don't find it, again, as much value as one month canceling or dropping for no use or the next month. It's, it's usually better as a trend over time. I find it really valuable to know the delta, what, how much we're growing. Well, I'd like to have it. So more than once per year? Yes. I have, uh, I, I have no opposition. If it was easy data to collect and it was valuable to one of the trustees, I have no objection. So I would say I concur. Okay, yeah, if it's easy, I would concur also. I just I do not know specifically in this district if they do it in batches or what their time period. A lot of libraries do it after like a certain amount of months. It may not be on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. but I will um, review our policy and see what we can offer as information. Betsy Robinson, isn't there yeah. just a simple number of how many patients we actually have at any given moment? Can't we just have that number and subtract? Mm -hmm. That would be your delta. I could yeah, see the change per month, how many in that number, if you want to do it that way. That's fine. I just want to look at the, how much we're actually growing. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, sounds like we have consensus for that. Uh, any other comments or questions? Does, you like? Does the staff have anything they'd like to say about um, circulation? Um, can you? New to your monthly report is um, the category new patrons by age and type. Um, so it has the total number of new patrons, those of which are adult or those with children open access and children's limited access. Thank you. That's useful information. Professor Rowlandson? Yeah, actually, I do have questions on that particular um, line item. Uh, in all those cases where the parents given the, the new information on the kids' cards, Yes, every time a child signs up for a card, their parent has to be present and their staff have a conversation. Um, we have all the information. Yes. Okay, and one other question on this, um, the very last the meeting rooms, and I might just be missing it, but is that um, uh, just for the month, those numbers? Yeah, thanks. Yes, for the same. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Comments. We will move on to the next section, our youth services report, staff presentation. Hello, I'm Karen Yother. I'm the Youth Services Coordinator for the Community Library Network. My department oversees programs and services for children, birth to 18, and their parents and caregivers. Everything we do is about creating, building, and nurturing relationships. We are a place to gather, learn, explore, and engage with books and people. Youth Services is comprised of 14 creative, highly trained and dedicated staff who provide exceptional programs and services to children, teens, and their caregivers. We currently have one 40 hour per week vacancy and new services staff hours vary from eight hours per week to 40. We have a robust onboarding and training for our youth services staff. New YS staff receive 40 hours of training in the first two months, including one on one visits with each YS staff member at their respective library. All YS staff participate in library staff meetings, quarterly YS staff trainings, virtual and in-person workshops. The work we do is driven by our mission, vision, and the strategic plan. Library programs are designed using research-based best practices following child development and literacy standards. A toddler or preschool program that incorporates shapes or blocks is the first step in learning to read. Shapes become letters, letters become sounds, sounds become words, words become sentences, reading. 
an after school steam program, Books and Bricks, where kids are tasked with creating a Lego design and demolishing it, uses problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, curiosity, logical math, and engineering design skills. Each program also includes books related to the theme, construction, architecture, demolition, and kinetic energy. A teen painting program provides a space for visual perception, spatial attention, and creativity, as well as self-expression and social connections. Spatial attention is an important skill for future work in math, technology, science, engineering, and visual arts. All skills needed for a strong future workforce. This year, we served 55,343 children, teens, and caregivers at our programs. This is a 12% increase from our fiscal 22 numbers. Our fiscal 23 budget was $43,000 which comes out to 78 cents per child. We anticipate another 12% increase in attendance from fiscal 23 to 24, bringing our total served to approximately 62,000. With our 24 budget of $30,000, we anticipate spending 48 cents per child, a 30 cent decrease. New programs or initiatives are funded through the generous support of the Friends of the Library. Grants fund giveaway books, summer reading prizes, the teen cooking program, and the hygiene hamper. A few years ago, I was invited to the Pentagon for a meeting to discuss summer reading <clears throat> and how to better serve military families. At one point during the meeting, I was asked why programming and summer reading mattered if libraries were really just about books. I explained that libraries are more than books about relationships. When you have a relationship with someone or someplace, you're more likely to engage with that person or space. When we have a relationship with a member, they're more likely to share with us that their child was recently diagnosed with diabetes. A family pet died over the weekend. Their child is scared of the dark, or maybe they're moving away. Each of these interactions are an opportunity for us to provide suggestions for books or community resources. And because of that relationship with our extraordinary youth services team, they come to programs and use the library. In the summer of 2017, Michael, shown here in the red sweater, drowned while attempting to save his older brother while swimming. His older brother later died as well. In November of that year, his sister came to the library to thank us for being kind to her brother. He loved coming to the library and enjoyed our programs and reading books, Hank the cow dog in particular. She wanted us to know how grateful she was that we welcomed her brother and were always kind to him, even when he was a bit precocious. We still miss seeing Michael at our programs and at the library. We continually cultivate the relationships with children, teens, parents, and community partners. Every program is an opportunity for learning and growth for every child, teen, and parent that attends. Last December, Hayden hosted a Holly Jolly Trolley Party to celebrate Daniel Tiger's 10th anniversary. Children decorated cardboard box trolleys and participated in other literacy-based activities. The highlight for staff was how much time children put into decorating their trolley and then watching parents help their child's vision come to life. One child commented, I love that party so much I didn't blink the whole time and now my eyes are tired. <laughs> Nature Berry programs provide children with an opportunity to explore all aspects of the natural world around them. From learning about the importance of bees and building bee houses, to dissecting scat to better understand the food chain, to creating edible aquifers to know more about the water under their feet, to experimenting with open and closed circuits to learn about electricity and how it powers our world. At the end of nearly every program, a parent or care caregiver thanks us for the program and shares what they or their child has learned that day at the library. Providing learning opportunities is just one aspect of library service that we excel at. We create literacy initiatives to support the needs of children and teens in our community. Youth services staff share literacy tips with parents regularly to help them help their child achieve academic success. Launch into Learning was a grant from the Idaho Commission for Libraries 
and a partnership with United Way of North Idaho with the goal of ensuring children enter kindergarten with the basic school ready skills to learn and succeed. The grant and partnership allowed us to create an activity guide for parents to work with their child on skills such as cutting, tracing, free reading activities, knowing shapes, matching items, recognizing letters. Sharing simple tips with families helps ensure children enter kindergarten ready to learn. The Thousand Books Before Kindergarten program encourages families to start reading aloud to their children at birth to help strengthen language skills and build vocabulary, two very important tools when children begin learning to read in kindergarten. This program targets children birth to four and strives to promote reading to newborns, infants, and toddlers and encourages parent-child bonding through reading. The concept is simple. Read a book with your child with the goal of a thousand books before they get to kindergarten. If you read one book per night, that's 365 per year, 730 in two years, and 1,825 in five years. The key is perseverance, and the library is here to help. Strategic partnerships build community and expand opportunities for the library and all of our members. A partnership is based on trust, common values, defined expectations, mutual respect, and excellent communication. The Youth Services team prides itself on cultivating strong community partnerships with organizations that help us provide exceptional programs and services to children, teens, and families. We have partnered with the park rangers at Farragut State Park for many years. This partnership has developed over time and changed as community needs have changed. Our Nature Brewery program and partnership has been replicated by other state parks as it demonstrates key elements of a successful partnership and a dynamic way to engage with people of all ages. We share a common goal of future building, introducing kids to concepts that may lead to a stronger workforce and building strong community connections, what we like to call tools in the toolbox. We have an exceptional team of youth services specialists at the Community Library Network. They provide high quality, engaging programs, exemplary customer service, and are continually learning and growing. They support the library policies and initiatives, providing information to members on a regular basis to ensure they are aware of changes to any library service. Ms. Bethany has worked hard to foster the partnership with Farragut State Park. She communicates regularly with park and library staff, she ensures families are aware of the free park passes and coordinates all aspects of this highly popular community program. Kelsey hosts a monthly virtual cooking program for teens to help them learn basic life skills. The month we made coffee cake muffins, one teen took his homemade muffins to the local police station as a thank you for their service. While another parent sent us a photo of their special needs child participating and thanking us for giving her child an opportunity to participate alongside her contemporaries. This is a grant program that has been funded by the Idaho Community Foundation, the Inovia Foundation, and the Friends of the Library. We began hosting Second Harvest in 2020 to serve those struggling in our community. Our quarterly food distributions serve 250 households and over 1,200 people. Many people arrive two hours early to line up and are humble and immensely grateful for this service. The YS staff comes together to support our community and greets every car with kindness, compassion, and a welcoming smile. The partnership with Second Harvest allows them a space to combat food insecurity and improve the lives of children and adults in our community. Over the years, the library network has grown to be a leader in the state. We have an award-winning staff and countless programs that have been replicated at the local, state, and national level. Staff serve on committees and are sought after for presentations, collaboration, and mentoring. We have presented for the Idaho Library Association, the Pacific Northwest Library Association, Montana Library Association, Association for Rural and Small Libraries, the Association for Bookmobile and Outreach Services, the Idaho Commission for Libraries, and the Washington State Library. Staff have presented webinars to local and national audiences on topics ranging from programming, summer reading, and partnerships to the importance of music and play in the library and teen services. I could not be prouder of this team and the work they do every day for every member of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I love the little sun points that were over the kids' faces. So anyway, show kids in their environment there. Um, do you have any questions? I have a question. Thank you. So that was a really great presentation. Yeah. Um, back to the um, the budget. Um, I believe you said it was in the 70s cents per child last year, and you're expecting it to, or it's dropped. Drop down to 40. Is that uh, including um, the the staff that is working the actual event? Are you factoring that into, or is it just the items you purchase for or the location you're at? Yeah, so that is just the YS line. I do not take into account how much we pay for AC and how much we pay for staffing. It is just the YS budget. Okay, thank you. Yep. I was going to make a comment on one of the two. One of the fun things that um, I don't know which one it is now, though. But it was a really great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Link. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it was. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And what I um, truly appreciate over and over again is, just, well, the commitment to literacy. I am, uh, and I also the commitment to partnerships where we get where we. When we partner with, we give more than 100%, which is awesome. So thank you for doing that. Okay. Sure. Uh, two quick questions. Um, you had pictures with the sheriff deputies, police officers. What did they do? And then the other was, well, go ahead. Yeah, so that picture was from our New Year's Eve celebration. So we celebrate uh, every year for the last six or seven years. A day before New Year's Eve, we do an event at the libraries and the kids get to celebrate with their families and welcome in the new year during the day. And so that was the year when um, I think it was 21 when we weren't able to be in the buildings. And so the sheriff's office sent deputies to send off their sirens at noon when we did our virtual ball drop. And then. Do you have any idea what the pamphlets or. Booklets or, or not booklets, but do you have any expenses that fall into the communication department, maybe that to, to run your programs, I guess? To yeah, so the big one for us is the summer reading guide, which we started doing a couple of years ago because in the libraries were doing it. So we were having staff, which was replicating work. And so to be more efficient and because families travel from library to library, we consolidated into one guide. So that way families can live in Post Falls and see that Rathroom is hosting something and go to that event. And actually what I was originally thinking was, do you have prizes of some sort for like reading contests? In summer we do. So if they read 15 days in June, they get a free book. Um, our partners at the North Idaho State Fair give us free fair passes for the kids that are five to 18. And so if they read 15 days in July, then they get a fair pass. And then August is usually something fun. Okay, uh, so that is our time for the section. Thank you so much for answering questions and for your presentation. Okay. Outreach services report. Thank you. Hello, my name is Karen Hall, and I'm the Bookville Outreach Manager. Um, I've been with the district for this is my 23rd year. I started here in August of 2001. I was a bookmobile driver clerk. And after a few years, I was a supervisor. And on October 1st, 2016, I became the manager. And I have to say, I love my job. I'm proud of what we do. It's a very unique service and a well-loved service too. Okay, let's see how we do here. So sometimes we go to, um, we go to events and that, or we go to a school or something, and people are like, what's a bookmobile? Like, they'll come on and ask you to sell books, or, you know, they just don't know what a bookmobile is. 
And Bookmobile is a mobile library. Its purpose is to reach portions of the community who might not otherwise have access to a library. And then outreach, that's also something that we go out in the community um, to provide services that otherwise people not may not be able to access. So our district, library district began in 1977. And interestingly, it began with a bookmobile or a bookmobile type vehicle, not like the one we have now. You can see the picture of it was like an old bread truck. In fact, when I was going to interview for this job, I asked someone because I, I live in Spokane. And so I didn't know the bookmobile over here. And I asked, so what does the bookmobile look like? Oh, it looks like an old bread truck. I'm like, OK, I could drive that because I'm used to driving like a Toyota or a Subaru. Or something. Mm -hmm. So then I came in for my interview and it was that little white bus down there right? in the corner. I'm like, oh, OK, well, that's a little bit bigger than what I was expecting. So anyway, um, a lot, some of the places that we went when we started the bookmobile, uh, rural areas, we still go. We still go to Cooney schools. We go to Canyon School, Rose Lake, places like that. And um, let's see, as the district grew among the years, we ended up having to get a bigger bus. That's back when it was called Kootenai Area Libraries and then Kootenai Shoshone Area Libraries. In 1992, they got the Bluebird bus, and that's the one I learned to drive on. That was um, 30 feet long. So then in 2007, we got a new bookmobile. It's a Thomas, a Thomas bus, and it's 36 feet long, which meant kind of learning how to drive a little bit differently again because you have to take bigger turns and things like that. Um, and then we also got a sprinter van to add to our services. So there is a picture up on top of the sprinter van. The sprinter van has a lift on it. So we have a cart on there that we pull off and take into facilities. Uh, places that add down below the bookmobile. Places that we go, we go to schools, senior apartment complexes, and also rural communities. We usually go places two times a month. And we're on the road year round. Some people think because it's winter, we don't go out. No, we're out there unless like schools close, we're out. Um, or in the summer, sometimes we'll say at the end of school year, the teachers, you know, have a good summer break and they'll say, you too. It's like, well, no, actually, we're still working this summer. Um, we travel about 7,000 miles a year and we go throughout Kootenai County and parts of Shoshone County. So some of the populations that we serve. There are a lot of places, schools such as uh, STEM, North STEM Academy up in Rathdrum. Some places, schools do not have any library. And so the kids wouldn't have any access to a library or, or a public library. So those are the kind of kids that we serve. We also go to rural areas. And um, because there's lots of places like, I think the library from, if you know where Metamon is, over south of, um, and around Rose Lake and that, it's like 18, 20 miles to get to the nearest traditional library. So, so this is much handier for them. So about half, our, half of our shelves have kids' books on them, and we have them arranged for age-appropriate browsing. And we also have the lobby slots, which I mentioned with the Sprinter van. You can see the cart up in the corner. Um, that's for seniors to go to senior facilities. We take the cart in. There's about 100 large print books on that cart on the top. And then the bottom two bins, they have uh, books on CD and also DVDs. So we also offer some programs. A really popular one is the technology open houses. We just go for a couple hours and people bring their phones or whatever they're having issues with, and we help them try to figure it out. We also have crafting classes. And then there's the well love in fall proof senior exercise class. In 2023, we were in six community parades, over half a dozen community events. We had pop-up bookmobiles, seven of them in different communities in Kootenai County and Shoshone County, and dozens of adult programs. Our biggest event was Family Day in the Park on June 9th. I've been doing Family Day in the Park for years. This is the biggest we ever had, 750 people. But it poured right before the event. We thought, oh, this is great. 
but then it cleared up and it was it was very successful. So between the bookmobile and Monisoft services, we visit schools, three after school programs, I'm sorry, five schools, three after school programs, almost 20 senior communities, and have five rural stops. In the past year, we've circulated about 30,000 items and have had about 12,500 people visit our bookmobile and our lobby stops. We have almost 2,000 card holders, but as you can imagine, we have people coming from all around the county. So we have people with cards from all the different libraries and like St. Mary's and places like that. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've had 230 new cards issued in the past year. And right now there's a pile because we're having everybody fill out new card applications for their kids. So we're going through all of them updating information. If they if they've chosen the restriction restricted cards, we're doing that. So we have so I don't know how many more we have. Them couple big piles of card applications that are office right now to finish. So driving a large vehicle like the bookmobile, it weighs over 26,000 pounds, and that means you have to have a commercial driver's license. In order to get that, you do some rigorous training, very stressful training, and then you need to take a test. Every two years, you need to have a health exam. Every morning before taking the bookmobile out on the road, drivers are required to do a pre-check. And you can see Connie's looking at the tires, and she's looking at the engine, and then the generator is up above where the engine is. So this is our staff. Um, Connie on the left, the first one, she's been with the library in general since 2008. She joined the bookmobile in October of 2010. Um, Sarah. Sarah's the only one that does not drive the bookmobile. She drives a Sprinter, but she's been with us now since October of 2017. And Rachel started working with us February of 2020. And the day before the world stopped in COVID, she got her CDL license. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to encourage you, if you see us out and about, please stop by and come, and come in and see. It's really, people are always, so impressed when they see it, the library on wheels. And it's really fun. Sometimes like Earth Day, we would have to come on. Oh, when I was growing up, I, I went to the book wheel and I loved it. So um, it's really a great thing. So you're welcome to come on anytime or come by the library. And if it's in the garage, you're welcome to come on and see it. Anybody have any questions? So I just want to clarify, uh, there's two Drivers CDL and do they have shifts or do they go yes. certain areas or? Yeah, we have. We a few years ago we started doing more, um, so people have a regular places they go. That way, you get to know the people better. The people get to know you. So, so they do have. I mean, everybody knows other places so they can fill in if they need to. Mr. Robinson, thank you. Um, do any of the vehicles go into the city of Coeur d'Alene since they have their own library? They do. There or like, like senior um, centers and that kind of stuff? centers, yeah. A couple of the after-school programs. Um, that's once a, once a month. We go to Skyway and we go to uh, Ramsey. Okay. Once a month. Do you go to Garden Plaza? We do go to Garden Plaza. Nice. So do I. Are, My great aunt lives there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really, that's one of our really big stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. like get like 20 seniors come down and we're there for like 45 minutes. Oh, wow. So it's, and we have a couple of our schools like a STEM and Christian Center School. Those we have like over 100 kids in a couple hours on there. So that's a little crazy, but it's fine. <laughs> how, how have you seen, um, the need for outreach slash bookmobile services change over time is, um, yeah, go ahead. It looks like you've got an answer. Oh, <laughs> stocks just aren't yeah, that's what the I'm same saying. anymore, right. I think. And sometimes I kind of get it. I mean, it's great if you don't have to drive to town to go to the library. On the other hand, if you want to go all of a sudden, oh, I got to go to the library. I want to go to the library because I want to book on dogs. and I don't want to have to wait till the book bill comes. You're going to go to town anyway. I can understand. People are just really mobile. 
Um, and then when we had COVID, they weren't quite as mobile, but they're they're pretty mobile again. Where do you see it? In, where do you see outreach or bookmobiles increasing? Services needed or increasing? Early seniors. Okay. We had schools. Okay. Yeah, not not. We love going to the rural communities because we like love driving the open road. <laughs> yeah, but I I have noticed that as well, and it, and the number of stops of course rural stops is, but people are so much more mobile than they used to be. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Questions? Sure. Yeah, good. What what's a pop up the bookmobile? Pop up bookmobile. We have other places to do it. We take the bookmobile just like one day in the summer for a couple hours. We pick a location and say, um, oh, um, Majestic Park in Brownsburg. And we just park there. We have activities. We have free books. And we're just open. People can come. They can check out books. They can get a library card. Just, just to show them. You know, and so the kid there just had to be at the park. Oh, let's go on the bookmobile. So it's a, it's a surprise unscheduled? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we did seven different parks this summer. We went to Farragut and a few other places. And it's pretty fun. Thank you. And it introduces people to the library and bookmobile. Too. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have our director's report. Take it away, director. Um, they did put two handouts on your table today. Um, the first one is labeled um, fiscal year 2024 carry forward. Um, so I have a memo and it kind of explains things and then attached is a more visual representation more of a and then some supporting documents um but currently we are estimating um our carry forward um or fund balance um slightly below what we would like to see um so the summary is the funds currently available for unexpected and unanticipated expenses are at 38 days with a goal of 60 days or two months reserve for unanticipated and emergency expenses. Um, and so I will say at this point, my comment would be that in order to maintain our long term financial stability and growth, that the board and staff will need to be conservative in managing risks and spending in fiscal year 2024. I don't know if you guys have any questions, but these are our current numbers. I'll go through the second page. It has our checking account balance and our ICS, ICS account balance and our available liquid funds. So that's that 2.4 number. You basically subtract everything <laughs> that's restricted carry forward funds and that's that 1.95 number. And then the money remaining that would be available for emergencies is $526,555. Um, and so it just sort of, again, represents the numbers that we need to look at. I know that's a lot of numbers, so, and you're reading, so I'm going to give you a minute. Why are accounts payable for FY23? Should I help out with it? <laughs> Probably would have already paid it if almost you, to the end of October. If you turn to the next page, you'll get it to it's our balance sheet. You'll see how we get that number. Um, under liabilities, it is 56,000. There are items that we have received sometimes that haven't paid. Um, and the items owing. And interest that occurred in, in that year. Right. Mm -hmm. Expenditures that have occurred this year. This year, but have not. But, but haven't been paid yet. Okay. Can you just give an example of one thing just so trustees can have that in their brain? Um, we purchased chairs, we've received them, we may not have invoiced them, or we may have put it on a credit card. Oh, that's already, okay, I'll let you know. Um, an example would 
the um, invoices that have come in late for services that were performed in September, but we did not get the invoice until October. So we had some um, HVAC invoices that came in late. We've had um, within the accounts payable are the credit card charges that occurred through September 30. So the statements haven't cut yet, but we haven't paid the statement. And the, the statements cut like mid month. So we'll have more charges coming. I like to write one check. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'll mention the next line said reserve for restricted funds. So restricted funds can be grants or specific funds that we have um, cash on hand, but they are for a dedicated purpose. Um, and then we did put in the four months of approximate expenditures. I will say that um, the library does not necessarily expend in a 112, 112, 112 model, which we've talked about before. We actually have higher expenses between October and January. We have a lot of our annual contracts that are fully paid in um, in October or in January. Um, one example is like our health care um, and our Viva accounts. We pay all of that um, before we receive the next property tax payment. Um, we have some items. We did not get the parking lot, the only in striping at Hayden and Apple. And we do have some Harrison funds that um, were set aside and we did not spend that yet. And so that's where we get the 526,000. If you're ready to move on to what is labeled the fiscal year 2024 expenditure concerns. Sure. Uh, Plus. I, I was just going to ask, thank you for say, thank you for bringing that forward. Um, this is what I was looking to try to get a handle on during the budget. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, let's watch this. Oh, thank you. Okay. Tracy Blank. So just to be really clear, um, we had the four months of expenditures um, showing, but we wanted a uh, two months of an emergency fund. And so at that point, and that should be 816,000, but we are short that 290,000. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So we are not, we don't have some sort of extra pool of money that we overlooked. We don't. Have extra money, I would say that we need to be conservative. Yeah, if we're three hundred thousand dollars short of it, and and it's an emergency fund, um, so instead of eight hundred and sixteen thousand, we have close to three hundred thousand less than that. Um, but that is that's real. That's very concerning that for me as looking back over time. That's very concerning. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is really clear. Uh, this is what. Um, uh, Janelle had given us too. Uh, I think it was dated July 23, and I find this incredibly clear to help us under to to see where we are at. So I appreciate it. I will mention that um, I am using the number 13,610, and that was based on the um, statement provided by our auditor for 2022. I can refine it further once she's done with the audit. Then we'll get the number for 2023. Um, so, but that is, I'm going to say, in the right ballpark, very close. Okay. Dr. Boss? I was just going to clarify, I think I'm the one that brought up we want two months extra because the that, that isn't part of the uh, Tony Hackwith comment. The two months came from me because that's what our county treasurer said, we shouldn't have more than two months. And that's why I wanted to reduce the fund if it was more than two months. Yeah, it should be more than a month, but we don't need to have exactly two months. It's just don't take extra from the taxpayers if it's more than two months. Do you want me to move on now? Are we good with that? And moving on to the concerns, expenditure concerns. Um, the summary is really that that first paragraph. Um, line seven where, one. where are you? Oh. On the document 2024 expenditure concerns. 
Um, line 71 is our insurance and line 72 is our legal and professional and we will likely see actual expenditures over our budget amount by approximately $63,000. Um, I'm bringing this to your attention now um, at the regular board meeting in November. I recommend that we evaluate and decide if our intention is to expend carry forward or to do, reduce other line items such as line 28 collections, physical and e-materials. Um, the insurance we had budgeted for fiscal year 2024 at $51,293 and our estimated actual is now 64,719. So that's 26% more or 13,426 over budget uh, with the addition of Great American Insurance. And then under legal and professional, I did include a little bit of last year's information here. Um, line 72 in the budget for fiscal year 2023 was 103,000. The board reduced that this year to budget to 82,000. Um, unfortunately, last year we did have our actual legal and professional go to 129,000. And I'm estimating for this year, we'll be going to about that same amount, 132,000. Um, so I'm estimating we're gonna run 61% or 50,000 over budget. I do include a little bit of the legal service history of how much we've paid. Fiscal year 21, we paid 3,128. Fiscal year 22, we paid 3,670. Last year, we paid 47,691. And that was broken up Lake City Law, 22,000, yeah. Stevens Clay, 7,000, and Boyle's Law, 17,994. Um, I'm estimating this year with Boyle's Law an average of 8,000 a month, which is what we've been seeing for approximately the last two and a half months. Um, it could go down lower than that, um, but depending on how many policies the board is reviewing, depending on other factors, how many meetings we have, how much um, items um, of a contentious nature, all those things are a little bit unknown, but I would estimate we continue to use the same amount that we're using now. And so again, about $63,000 that we'll need to either be evaluating for the carry forward. So that would be reducing our carry forward even further than 38 days um, or shifting some of our current planned expenses and letting staff know in advance so that we can start earlier in the year. Conclusion. Okay, uh, thank you. And next we'll have our legal counsel report. Can I? Yeah, uh, we have some. Oh, uh, well, time is up. I, I, it, this is really it's important. Great. This is, I mean, we're talking really over budget in ways that, that the directors just this is our one of our most important jobs. Whether we go over or not, this is really important. We're aware of it. Then let's talk about it. So it's a little discuss that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. We've, We've got, got a couple of. Well, I, I I just so at least what's up. So no, I just at least wanted to um, recognize what was just said, and that this is um, pretty significant. Uh, and no, you don't wait until November. To start talking about something like this. Um, well, there, there just isn't time to squeeze everything in. So, uh, Trustee might have something really short. I very much feel that this is this is limiting discussion that is extremely important, and that seems to be happening again and again. This is horrifying. Um, and I think it's really important that there's a lot of time put on it in, in the meetings to come. Okay, so everyone put on your thinking caps and, and come up with solutions and next month we okay. will discuss them. So we are moving on to the legal counsel report. Sure. sure. And we're moving I, on. I was just going to ask, is this report that be discussed or is that part of the monthly report? Is that part of the report? It's um, not it, on the it agenda. Would, it would have been. Um, yeah, but we are, okay, yeah, I guess we're not going to discuss Okay, we can ask staff afterwards. Um, so, training boards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
I was asked to do a review of the resolution for the community library network to disassociate with the American Library Association. Um, the version that I have that I think is before the board right now, it contains three whereas is and now there are four with two paragraphs of resolution. And the be it resolved section states that CLN will no longer have any association with or be associated with the ALA, its affiliates, organizations, subdivisions, or subsidiaries thereof. And the second paragraph states that no CLN monies will be used for any membership, training, informational services, materials, events, promotions, or campaigns sponsored by the ALA or any of the above aforementioned entities. CLN policies will be adjusted to reflect the same. I did receive some feedback and some concerns related to these policies. Um, those primarily had to do with. Future events that could arise based upon this language and some concerns related to existing policies that will be adjusted if an issue arises. Then I didn't find any federal or state law case law on point that would uh, prohibit a disassociation with a nonprofit organization based upon financial concerns. And the way I read this resolution is that CLN, the district, is not going to have official associations with that nonprofit, nor will CLN, the district, um, use its budgeted funds for the list of items below. It uh, doesn't appear to reflect or affect any of the staff or trustees or the director in their personal capacities to uh, read the material or go to an ALA event or any of that. So it seems to be just concerned with the district's budgetary actions. And so I don't see any any legal significant legal concern with the resolution as it's drafted. And so my recommend I don't have a recommendation to not. This is what the board, uh, the language the board wants to wants to improve. And I can get into more specifics if you would like, but. Uh, Trustee Hanley. So you, you don't see any. Realistic legal threats with the document as as prepared. Well, I mean, there's there's always an issue. Things have been highly contentious lately with. This issues, these issues, they're matters of public concern. They're hot topics, but the board does have. Uh, significant authority under 332720, both B and D, to establish policies and also to oversee the financial management of the district. And that appears to be what this resolution is invoking, is both the policy and financial management. If it's not, then we should address those concerns, amend the policy accordingly, um, or take another action. But I, I don't see those concerns. Thank you. We won't be the first people to leave the ALA. Thank you, Council. Uh, Trustee Mike. So um, I, I have a. Did you say that there are now four whereases instead of three? Uh, no, Trustee okay. Blake. Um, I have three whereas paragraphs and then two resolve. OK, so five total and then an adopt and an approved okay. line at the bottom. OK. Thank you. And it was I part have, of the board packet, so I think. No, I've got it. I just I thought I heard four, and I just wanted to make sure I had what. Was, um, so I uh, does this this resolution feels sounds very confusing to me. I understand not wanting to spend money, um, but I am also wondering if in its sweep, it limits staff operate. Does it have a what what effect does this have on the operations? And that would be a question for the director. Do you see that this resolution has an effect on operations? Does it limit the staff's access to information and ideas that they need to do their job? Director? Yeah. Um, I did have some correspondence um, with legal counsel, and I did outline some of those concerns. Um, well, one of my concerns is that it's referring to CLN's funding and um, 
the operational expenditures typically fall under the scope of the administrative team. Um, and even, even information such as the agreement that this board reached with me for the responsibility of the administration and management of public library services, which is also stated in the financial management policy that the board oversees the general financial administration and relies on the administrative team for day-to-day -day operations and financial decisions. So I'm concerned that you know, the policy or the resolution of policies um, that no CLN membership or monies will be spent on those things, but it's, it is really operational expenditures. Um, I'm concerned about the vagueness of campaigns sponsored by ALA. Um, a lot of the campaigns that I mentioned before, Library Card Sign Up Month or National Library Workers Day, those are essentially ideas. And so there is no cost. And so I don't see how it is falling under the financial management plan or how the board has the authority to um, state that those ideas will not be explored um, or, or displayed. Um, I do have concern about, again, the no financial impact of social media posts um, and displays of items that are already owned. Um, and then I expressed that um, the board has in my job description a mandate that the director meet knowledge and professional development expectations. Um, and again, um, with this removal, I'm not sure that there is a, 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 an avenue for me to obtain professional development in, as a public library director. Um, so those are some of my concerns that I expressed. I additionally provided legal counsel an alternative version of a resolution um, that talks about um, essentially the need to disaffiliate, but focusing on that we will no longer pay um, for a national organization and putting more emphasis on regional associations and that the decision for regional state and local library association participation would be made on a case by case by the director. Um, and again, um, I think that by disaffiliating with ALA, we don't have a code of ethics for library trustees and staff, um, and it significantly limits the training for trustees as well as staff for professional development and continuing education. So that comes back. I have um, my question is so big. Thank you. Recognize who, whose hand was up first? Oh, I wasn't. Oh, okay, trustee Blank. Sorry. Um, so what I'm afraid of is that this limits the staff's access to information and ideas and trustees, and that that limiting that is limiting First Amendment rights for the staff, that this is so vague that that's what it's doing. Um, and, it, and that by limiting those First Amendment rights, does that make the library vulnerable to a lawsuit? Um, that's a, a real concern to me because that's what it sounds like in here is that the staff is not able to access information and ideas to help them do their job. Um, I'm also con very concerned about the resolution being in conflict with Idaho code because Idaho code says that the services of the library shall meet the standards of the, of the um, library commission, which is the Idaho commission for libraries. And the Idaho for Commission for Libraries uses the Library Bill of Rights and the Freedom to Read as standards. Those are standards. So is this is this resolution not in conflict with what code is telling us? Um, and I am I I am very concerned because it it's so sweeping, it is so sweeping, and it is so vague in here that it takes away every access. It, it, there is a potential for taking away access to library staff for everything that they need to learn throughout. The, day. the American Library Association is the biggest library association in the world. And it sets the standards for public libraries. And by throwing out everything, any contact, you are throwing out standard, us holding ourselves to the standards of a public library. Uh, so there are other professional library associations. There's the Idaho Commission for Libraries, um, and also, uh, I, if I remember correctly, the motion was to approve 
uh, the ALA disaffiliation pending that there was no objection by the attorney, which it doesn't sound like it was. So we, we've already approved this policy. Uh, Trustee Robinson. Uh, so the Idaho Commission of Libraries, are they not affiliated with the ALA at all? Because if they are, there's a problem on this paper. It means we can't be affiliated with them either. And then I was also going to ask about any libraries in the CIN. Are they affiliated with the ALA? And if they are, we can no longer be affiliated with them. I just wanted to comment uh, from another trustee's uh, comments. Uh, nothing prevents members of this board or the staff from spending their own money to do as they please and join any organization or association they wish. So there is no First Amendment uh, violation, in my opinion, there. Certainly they're open. They can do whatever they want to do with that. So, um, and I, I tend to agree with the chair that we did vote on this. I thought the pending issue was for legal review. The legal review has been done. My understanding is there are no concerns uh, with, with the um, uh, resolution. So um, I don't know what further discussion we need to keep working on this. And I, I feel like we've made a decision and it was reviewed. And I think that we should um, use our time wisely. Thank you. Excuse me. I, I, uh, who was first? I was because I asked questions. Those, those were not statements. I want to know if we are, if the, I see the Idaho Commission of Libraries, are they affiliated with ALA? And any libraries in the CIN, are any of them affiliated with the ALA? That was a question. And I need it answered. Everybody needs that answered. Okay. Trustee Plus. Those libraries you mentioned are affiliates of ALA, just because they may have, they may be paying for some memberships or something. That doesn't mean they're affiliates. Affiliates is an organization. It is a subdivision of the ALA. Can you please ask people to be more I can't hear the uh, other trustee. I'm sorry. I disagree on that. And what about the Idaho Commission of Libraries? I mean, that's the kind of thing that needs to be more. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm actually wanting this to be answered by legal or the director. I'm sorry, trustee. And the legal director, you will answer that. It's unclear to me um, in the line that says if affiliation, affiliates organizations. Um, we had talked about the ALA website and their listing of current affiliates. I do not have an understanding of what is meant by organizations. Um, and again, it, there had been some previous versions, and so it's it's unclear to me what the intention is at this point. Um, the um, other libraries may be ALA members. Is that meaning that we can't associate with them or we have a cooperative agreement and we have a uh, assigned agreement to be a part of CIN? I, I do not know if that is what it means. Um, seems to me we had an, an earlier discussion, I don't know, in the last year about, um, about whether was it the HREI or the uh, other pride thing about whether they were an affiliate or not? And it was brought up that there's a, there may be a legal definition of affiliate and just being uh, working together on a project doesn't make someone an affiliate. Um, so I would mm -hmm. imagine that that would be the same case in well, this case. The use of the word organization. What is an ALA organization? Do you like yes. me to respond to yes, Trustee no, Robinson? Okay. So on the first resolve paragraph, there's there's association and affiliate. And so the CLN is not associating with ALA. And associate, in my view, is a, is a broader word. Um, a quick definition I found is uh, connected or amalgamated with something else. Um, an affiliate has, I think, more of a specific meaning um, one definition of affiliated is closely associated with another typically in a dependent or subordinate position 
So I certainly wouldn't say the Idaho Commission for Libraries would be subordinate to the ALA, if anything, it's opposite. And it doesn't actually mention ALA's associates, it mentions their affiliates. And so I think the more narrow term is used there and set should alleviate some of those concerns regarding the Commission for Libraries. That's my view of it. Trustee Blaine? Um, uh, the, uh, I have a couple of things. The Idaho Commission for Libraries is established by Idaho Code. It is not a, it's, it's not a membership organization. Um, and it establishes the standards for which a public library in Idaho is supposed to operate. Um, that is stated clearly in Idaho code. The other thing that I'd like to say is on the agenda, there is legal counsel report. And then the next item down is discussion to disaffiliate with ALA and its subsidiary action item. So there's obviously some con confusion as to that's why I'm having this discussion because um, that was on there as an action item. And I'm, you know, I'm very concerned that this resolution um, places us in a very vulnerable position in terms of a lawsuit. And I, that's what I'm that's what I'm looking at. And that, you know, I, I don't have any idea what our next item is. Since you guys have already decided that we have passed this resolution and the attorney thinks it's OK. And so we're so I have no idea where we're going with that next agenda item. Sure, yeah. if I may. Okay, uh, trustee Blank, I, I just want to clarify that um, I've heard several comments from trustees that characterize my position relating to the resolution. I just want to be clear that my role is simply to perform a legal review of this resolution precisely. No other issues, no other social issues or any personal um, positions was was were meant to be communicated. And so I'm solely looking at existing case law, existing law. I'm trying to figure out if the words in this resolution directly conflict with the statute, if there's a case on point, that type of thing. And so I, I would like, I would prefer if my comments are not, and not this isn't directly to you, Trustee Blake, but if the comments related to if I'm okay with it or I approve it, it's related to the legal review of it, not actually my view of the resolution, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Thank you. I could just point out, and I'm just going to say, so in the third paragraph where it says provided to the AOA, and it says it's affiliates, organization, subdivision, and subsidiaries. And then again, in the fourth paragraph, it says AOA, it's affiliate, organization, subdivisions. So I do not have a clear understanding of what an AOA organization is. And does that mean that any organization like a public library that like the Coeur d'Alene Library, the Liberty Lake Library that is affiliated with ALA, and I don't know if they are, but I'm just saying, what does that mean specifically? Okay, so these, uh, I'm not sure why these two things were split out because it seems to me like it's the same discussion. So um, anyway, just so everyone's aware that we're in the second part of that discussion uh, to disaffiliate with the ALA, even though we've already voted on it. So if I could make a comment because I did assist with that part. So I needed to be clear when a policy goes into effect. And so because normally or um, best practices would be to have legal review of policy or resolution before it's actually adopted or voted upon. And so in this case, because it was kind of the cart before the horse, um, I needed to be made very clear that that um, caveat that legal has um, approved it essentially or not found any finding um, that it's now effective after today's meeting. And so for that point of clarity for staff, I'm, I've, I've added that as the action item. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, the resolution is already passed and the director has a draft that it has not been shared with the board. So she, uh, we would welcome you sharing that with us um, like for our next packet or something. Um, do we, uh, Trustee Plant, or well, actually, let me finish my thought. I would like to ask if we have consensus that it goes into effect after today, but go ahead with your question. I was just going to say our last meeting where we were going to discuss this and legal counsel didn't have time or hadn't prepared for it. 
we had on the agenda uh, release. So it was legal counsel giving us okay, and it was called release of the of the uh, resolution. 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 So that's what I understand this to be: is if he gives an okay, it should be a release. Right. So we have the consensus then that, or do we have consensus that it would be in effect after today? Yes. No. So uh, there, Audison, if I may. Yes. I, if there is any confusion, I would recommend just voting on it. It's listed as an action item to disaffiliate, um, and that's done through the resolution. And so, if there is any confusion, if it's related to releasing the resolution or the policy. For the benefit of the director to understand her responsibility moving forward, it would be effective immediately after you vote to approve it, unless you say you want it to start tomorrow or at midnight or whatever. So that's a real clear signal to the director of what her responsibilities are. I think that would be fair. Sure, make a motion. Uh, yes. I move that we disaffiliate with the American Library Association in accordance with the resolution that was presented to the board. Okay, uh, I think I'm needing this last part of it. Okay, so you moved that we disaffiliate with the ALA in accordance with the resolution as distributed to the board. Okay, it has been moved that we disaffiliate with the ALA in accordance with the resolution as distributed to the board. We have further discussion. Trustee Robinson. Um, was the director talking about some paperwork that she had um, different ideas about this and you said she could present it next if, if she wanted, she, if she has a draft, I haven't seen it. But we're going to vote today on on passing this. But she might have something else. I, I was confused well, on what she was saying. Okay, well, we, we have already passed it, but I guess just for clarity, we're running the, the motion again. Okay. Um. I still have deep concerns that this resolution um, is in conflict with Idaho code. Okay, well, I'm going to defer to our attorney who's already said that he hasn't found conflict. And I would just state on the record that it's unclear to me what an ALA organization, subdivision, or subsidiary thereof is. And me as well. Can I suggest that when occasions come up, the library director is unclear that particular organizations that they be brought to council. Sounds like a good idea. Reasonable. Trustee Robinson? Uh, you know, that does sound like a good idea, but I literally just asked him if he could, you know, tell us what exactly that meant. And he he did read some things off to us. I'm not saying he didn't try to give an answer, but we're still not 100% on on if the ICOL or CIN, if that would be an issue. I just still think it's it's just that section is the part I have the biggest problem with. It's you know the affiliates, organization, subdivision, subdivary thereof. I don't think it's clear what it is. Question. Okay, if there's no more discussion. Uh we will proceed to the vote. It has been moved that we disaffiliate with the ALA in accordance with the resolution as distributed to the board. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. And I'm going to have to abstain still because, because of the reasons that I spoke of. Okay. Thank and you. That, that's a shame because if it was if it was more clear, I could have a, a much clearer vote. Okay. The ayes have it, and the motion is carried uh, that we disaffiliate with the ALA in accordance with the resolution as distributed to the board. Same, same. All right, and now we will move to discussion of the IFRAMP appeal. Director, did you want to? 
start with that? Oh, I did not plan to. Oh, um, okay. Did you want me to start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So I submitted the, uh, I submitted an appeal to ICRAMP and we are set for the October 25th meeting uh, at one o'clock and uh, this is a, a 16 hour drive and a hotel stay. Uh, they are uh, providing the option of, I can't remember if it's team, Teams or Zoom, um, anyway, but an online option for uh, me or someone else to present that. If that's basically what I had. Uh, Trustee Mike? So who is going to do the appeal? Is that, is that, I, I thought you had said it was you, but then at the end it's sort of, so who is planning to do this, make this appeal? Um, again, I was planning to. So what is going to be presented to them? Um, uh, well, the information from the, the five-year uh, loss, the five-year loss history, um, and I guess I kind of assumed that I would work with the director on that, or is that just something I come up with on my own? I, I probably you would know the information that they would like to have better. Yes, you would obtain for us. I feel a little bit conflicted about that because I provided the board with some suggestions yes. um, in two memos, and I don't think that was particularly um, appreciated by all of the board. So I don't. I, I'm happy to help put together whatever whatever appeal that you want. Um, I would just need more guidance. Um, like I said, my default would be to identify areas that we've learned mm -hmm. from and maybe maybe taken some minor missteps in the past and then focus primarily on a plan for education and commitment to being a partner with ICRIT moving forward. And so I don't know if that is the general note or tone that the board would want. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm happy to assist in whatever way I can. But I feel a little bit conflicted that my earlier documents um, had concerns expressed about. Sure. Okay. Well, yeah, I wasn't. Um, I don't think I was against everything that was in there. Um, I'm sure there's any useful information. I just I haven't gone through the appeal process before, so I, I you know didn't know if there was more information on top of that than what they needed. Trustee Boss. So, uh, Chair, your outline is right here in your letter. At three points, directors, officers' liability had been continuously enforced for more than 20 years, no reduction of employees or change of status. Um, anyway, we just want to go with the basics of our performance and how we've been instead of hypothecating what might be a concern. Okay. Yeah, I just I figured that, you know, they already have that information, so I was. I'm uh, not sure if they needed additional information or not. Trustee Mike? Um, I I reviewed what the uh, the original letter that um, uh, the draft that had come from the director, and I would like to say that I was very much in in support of the board taking responsibility and looking at what its actions may have caused. Um, because it was such a uh, sudden and very dramatic uh, reduction in insurance, um, and I think it I think it pointed very clearly to some uh, things that the board, perhaps as a new board, um, was doing, and to not take any responsibility at all, and to not be willing to participate in any kind of. Um, trustee education at all is a little bit or bigger than a little bit disturbing to me that we are not going to do that. I can't imagine that ICRIMP is going to see anything in this. If not taking responsibility for some of the things we may have done recently, but looking back, that's not going to, that's not going to cut it. They're going to, you know, that, you know, that, I don't think that's going to make any difference. It, I, my suspicion is it has to do very much with some things we've done recently, like violating the joint powers agreement. And that's all I have. Okay, Trustee Foss. So 
I implore you, don't offer to them things that we think or some people think might be a problem. Let them tell us. Go to them and you're asking for an appeal. Give the our good history and ask them, why did you do this? Let them say. It could be something completely different than what we're what the library director wrote suggested. To do um, an initial memo that I wrote when we learned about the policy change, but um, based on the recommendation of the executive director Tim Osborne for Akron, he basically stated that the best appeals are from an elected official to another elected official because they are an elected board. And so that's why the preference is over staff or legal counsel or anything like that. So whatever the elected official language is, right, um, then I would maybe include that as part of the appeal, if that makes sense. Plus. I don't know whether how much more discussion we need on this particular thing, but the idea was we were going to continue looking for other insurance that may be its full coverage. This is maybe no more this than a prayer and a wish that we're going to get everything restored. But I'd like to ask the library director if we've made any progress in looking for other insurance is I know I saw an email about it, but has anything been done about it? Have you worked with Redmond where they offered to process if you gave them the forms for a midterm insurance full coverage? That's not on the agenda. Well, it's part of this. This is why we are saying we've got to be careful in what we're doing. The agenda says discussion of ICRIMP appeal action item. And technically, it doesn't state insurance. So, um, okay. Well, I think that I've got enough to go on to uh, produce a little presentation for iGrimp, unless there are other suggestions. Um, all right, then we will move on. Has there been a vote on the uh, actual presentation? Uh, have you present? Is that? Already been done. This is an action item. So, do we need to have a motion and <clears throat> authorize you to appeal? Oh, generally, the chair can be the default unless it's otherwise decided. So, in this case, because it's the chair, I don't have any objection. Okay. If it was someone else or a team or something yeah. to represent on behalf of the board, but the, the chair is the default. Okay. So right of the board. Sounds great. I just heard some discussion about who was going to present. So, I thought maybe we would need to codify that, but if you're comfortable with that, I think it'd be okay. Okay. All right. There is there is further discussion. <laughs> I, I would like an answer. Maybe it could be after the end of the meeting, but would the library director please answer, has anything been done with possibly a full coverage insurance? We just work with it. Because we had Not a, on the agenda. we had a consensus, um, all four of us asked. That's true, but I'm I'm sorry, uh, trustee class mm -hmm. that 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 is uh, out of order, I guess, because it doesn't say insurance. It says I can't appeal. Um, all right, so we are moving on to our next item, which is a five-minute break. We will reconvene at 4.13. Sure. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so we will now have a discussion of uh, prior Can we have an order in the court, please? Yeah. Can the audience, please, if, if you're going to continue to talk, which is fine, take it out to the hallway. Thank you. All right. Discussion of prior trustee continuing education. Uh, I believe Trustee Blank has some questions. I do. Um, this is concerning the trustee edu continuing education handout of 921-23. And this was, from my understanding, was put together by Chair Audison, is that correct? Uh, that is correct, and I try to okay. do direct quote as much as possible, so it wasn't my words, um, except for where it took up an entire chapter to discuss uh, an idea. Um, that way you could 
go and, and look them up. So did you look up all the, the references? I certainly did. Okay. Um, I, I have concerns about this and I have concerns because this was, these are, um, this is put forward as the way the board operates and yet it's the opinion of one person and not, it wasn't ever anything that was put for any kind of discussion to the board. My concerns start with the precedent of rules, and I feel like this has come up before in our board. Um, it says law supersedes bylaws, but I feel like we're mixing up things here. Laws are things that are imposed upon us from the outside by the feds, by the state, you know, by local. Um, bylaws and Robert's Rules of Order or Parliamentary Procedure are things that we vote on. They are, they're not laws that can be taken to court as far as I know. And, and they, they are procedures that we vote on as a board and say, we will operate in this way. So there's no outside law that trumps it or anything. That's, I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Um, we voted to accept our bylaws. And in those bylaws, we voted to accept Parliament, the parliamentary procedure of Robert's Rules of Order for Small Boards. Um, if the so parliamentary procedure helps us learn to operate in a democratic manner, and uh, and that and that's I mean we want to we have chosen to operate in a democratic and parliamentary procedure helps us do that. The purpose of parliamentary procedure, there's several reasons we use it, but one is to maintain the rule of the majority, but the other is to protect the rights of the minority to speak. Um, and, and also to ensure that the meeting moves forward in a democratic fashion. If we as a board have, have voted to accept these bylaws, and if though in those bylaws, we have vote, vote said that we will use the procedures of Robert's Rules of Order as a whole. What this does, this paper does, is sort of cherry pick Robert's Rules of Order. You know, we'll use all of Robert's Rules of Order except this one I don't care for. We'll, you know, or that one I don't care for. And when we do that, it ceases to become Robert's Rules of Order and becomes, I don't know, Audison's rules of order, I don't know, but we have voted as a board to use it in, in whole. The other thing is this thing of majority vote. Um, the major, the by, our bylaws say the majority, a majority is made up of three people. That's right. It does not say that you cannot use a supermajority. And there are several times in parliamentary procedure where a supermajority not there, not a lot of times, but there are some times where a supermajority is required in using parliamentary procedure or Robert's Rules of Order, and that is typically to protect the minority's ability to speak. And so I am very concerned that this is somebody's idea of how the board should run, and but what it has a tendency to do in more ways than one, but I'm just looking at these two things right now, is that it is silencing the minority. And that's what it seems like. And that seems that seems wrong. The bylaws do not say that you cannot have a supermajority vote. Um, so I I would like us to operate completely from our bylaws and from Robert's Rules of Order without picking out what we like and what we don't like. All right. So our and it's almost up, but just to address those real quick, um, the, the precedence of rules it just means that if there's a conflict between the two, the, the higher up one uh, prevails over the lower one. Um, and I didn't, by any stretch of the imagination, mean to convey that these are the only Roberts rules that we're going to follow. It was just that these are continuing problems. They keep coming up. So I just figured, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll make direct quotes here of what the laws and the rules say. Um, so I guess that is our time. And that this is actually uh, to be discussed outside of the meeting. If there are further questions, because these are, I don't think that this is specifically to do with making policy or anything like that. I, I think that these would be fine to discuss outside of outside of meeting. All right. So our 
Next item is the trustee continuing education first amendment uh, by Boyle's law. We have a case here I printed out little versus uh, Yano County. I think we got the right number here. If I'm wrong, maybe you can have my highlighted copies. Sorry. Oh, thank uh, you. So you can have the highlighted one. Actually, let's do plus. Can I switch it? I found it. Oh. Okay, for those of you who don't have a copy, this is Little versus Yano County. It's the United States District Court for the Western District of Texas in the Austin Division. Um, it was decided March 30, 2023. The reporter is 2023 U.S. District. The Lexus number is 54716. And the Westlaw site is 2023 Westlaw 273. 1089. If anyone didn't get that, I'm happy to say that again. Um, the underlying federal case is 1 colon 22 dash CB dash 424 RP, and the letter on the end usually signifies the judge. Um, I chose this case for the attorney um, sort of educational portion because it's it's really new. It's one of the most cutting edge federal cases related to some of the issues that we're either dealing with or will likely be dealing with. And although it may not be entirely precise on the law or everything may not be correct, these district court opinions are usually pretty well reasoned and, and pretty spot on. And so it gives you a good idea of where we might end up in Idaho um, if we face a similar circumstance. And so I'm just going to go over the basic facts of the case um, quickly and then kind of point you guys to where the standard of laws are in the opinion. And then you could go back and read it, review it. If you have questions, we can do a follow up. So this uh, this county system is a little different than ours. They have commissioners and judges are involved. And so it's, it's not quite the same, but it's still a, a governmental entity that regulates the library. So the, the laws, the federal laws are going to be about the same that that apply. So these these plaintiffs uh, contended that the defendants, meaning the library, essentially district trustees, were infringing on their First Amendment and specifically their right to access and receive ideas by restricting access to certain books based on their messages and content. And so um, because of that and other actions that the trustees took, they also claim their due process rights were infringed upon when they weren't given prior notice when the trustees either removed certain books or caused them to be removed. Um, they also made other claims, but some of them were moot. They had an electronic book system that they had replaced, so the court didn't hear that. And then they didn't really properly address access to public meetings, and so the court didn't address that. So I, I'm not going to cover that here today. Um, of note on page two on your copy is that the library system used the, the crew system or the continuous review evaluation and, and weeding system to uh, make space for the new acquisitions. And underneath that paragraph, the court sets forth the facts as presented in the complaint there where it starts early July 2021. So if you want to get a feel for I, I would term probably how aggressive these candidates and trustees were being about removing certain books. This will kind of tell you the chronology of, of how that occurred. And the reason why I'm choosing this case is because many of the books, um, the theme for many of the books at least appear to be um, sexual activity, questionable nudity, and that's kind of a hot topic in the news here lately. So I thought this would be a good case. Um, Interestingly, the, the board approved to close the library for three days and they went through the catalog. So they shut the whole library down. They, they reviewed the library catalog. They got rid of Overdrive and then replaced it with Biblioteca. And 
Then they instituted a policy that all new books must be presented to and approved by the board before purchasing them. And so that there was just pretty aggressive action by the board from front to back. So I'm going to push forward to about page five. This starts to get a little bit more into the court's analysis or the court's making uh, sort of some characterizations about that conduct. And the court did find in response to them asking for a preliminary injunction that there was a continuing injury. Um, and then some of the claims weren't moved. The overdrive claims were, um, but they were didn't find persuasive that the defendant's actions did not constitute government speech and that the defendants unlawfully removed books based upon their viewpoint. So we had one public commenter mention content based and a viewpoint based um, discrimination. And both, both of those are at issue here, but at this early stage of the case, it was mainly mainly a viewpoint based analysis the court was looking at because they were picking out one, their viewpoint essentially over other people in the publics or whatever and discriminating on that basis. Um, the court notes on page five, right above the number two mootness in the standing section that the removal of those books initiated plaintiffs injuries and the infringement on their right to access information is a continuing present adverse effect and qualified as an injury for Article three purposes. And that means that the court would allow those plaintiffs to sue. Um, let's see. Also of note on page six, if you look at the last full paragraph on the first column under physical books, the court notes how the plaintiffs um, claims were moved weren't moved as to the physical books because the library made available the books in like a different way, um, even though they may have been hidden from view and absent from the catalog. Um, the court said their existence is not discernible to the public, nor is their availability. An injury exists because the library's in-house checkout system still places a significant burden on library patrons ability to gain access to those books. And there's a different standard slightly. This is the Fifth Circuit, so they use the Campbell case. And you have the acquisitions body of law, and then you have the removal body of law. And so as you're reading this, it's sometimes hard to not conflate those, and they're not precisely the same. And so just keep in mind that there's there's an acquisition and a removal policy that are at issue and they may not have the same court analysis applied to them. Um, and so that's what that footnote four is where it talks about how the Fifth Amendment Circuit <clears throat> recognizes the First Amendment right to access information and that First Amendment protections apply to the removal of materials in public libraries. And so that would be after going through the acquisition process. We've had the book one day, 50 years, it doesn't matter, it's still in the catalog. And then the library takes action to pull that book from the catalog. That's going to be the set of the body of law we're discussing. Of note, quotes on page seven, quoting the US versus American Library Association, the Supreme Court recognized that public libraries should be afforded broad discretion in their collection selection process in which library staff necessarily consider book content, but that the Supreme Court in a plurality notes that discretion is not absolute because the, the right to receive information um, they recognized a First Amendment right to receive information which prevents libraries from removing books from school library shelves simply because they dislike the ideas contained in those books. And so that means it's important to have a policy that governs that and to follow that policy. And then of note, critically here on page seven is, the key inquiry in a book removal case is whether the government's substantial motivation was to deny library users access to ideas which the government disagreed. And then uh, the court notes that the, they agreed with the precedent, which indicates school libraries are a unique environment. And that's another place where I see people getting confused on 
what constitutional analysis applies here. But I want to note there are similarities to to the school body of law because there's been some recent trends. Another case out of Texas that talks about the government's heightened interest in protecting minors. And so so when it comes to specifically any minor content, there will be a little bit of broader discretion for the government. Um, since my time's up, I will feel free anyone to reach out to me if you have any questions on this or you need more information or cases. Is there any way he can um, finish whatever yeah. he was going yeah. to present? Right. Yeah. Sure, sure. There's just a couple more important points yeah. I thought yeah. come out yeah. of this case that really help us if we do change these policies and we are kind of looking at a selection policy that this will be important for. Um, so. The content based based uh, the, the discrimination applies to a particular speech because of the topic discussed or the idea messaged or expressed. And so we we definitely want to be careful we don't get viewpoint based and content based together because let's say you have one issue that you personally discriminate on and then there is a category of books that we want to go remove and then we make a policy there. They could potentially ding us on the viewpoint based and the content based because of the, the, the language of the policy. Um, the court here found that the, the defendants essentially came up with a post hoc justification that they found was pretextual because they didn't really follow a routine weeding process from the library catalog. There was a lot of evidence of, of prior communications where these these trustees, I'm calling them, sort of engaged in a, a community effort to get rid of certain books and made steps to report them, and then they got elected and sort of followed through. And so, for instance, uh, one of them, Ms. Wells, testified at the hearing that if there was any book that, in her opinion, was harmful to minors that was in the library, I would speak with the director to have it removed. So the court heavily relied upon those types of statements to find a discriminatory animus towards re the removal when she had her official capacity. And then the other critical fact I think here is that um, there was a list of objectionable books that they made, and then there was no evidence that any of the books slated to be removed for the weeding prior to the receipt of those complaints, but that actually many other eligible books for weeding based on the same factor appear to have remained on the shelves for many years. So just a reminder or a, a good sort of banner is that this uh, evidence that the court will look at in the event of a lawsuit can get really granular down to the point of looking at what books were slated to be reviewed, the review process, what other books were not weeded or crude or however you guys say it. Um, and so I think this is a very helpful case to look at your if you're bowling, you got your I don't know what you call those, but definitely take a look at this, see what the court's saying, and let's keep it in between those outer boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And now we will move on to uh, the discussion of materials selection policy. Oh, um, do you have an agenda for this? I think I am starting exactly where we were when we um, when we started to talk about this before, and then it is I have no idea what we're talking about. I are we talking about we've been given handouts. We've you know um, we have not received any kind of. Um, we, we, we haven't received any kind of suggestion from staff in terms of material selection. We have our regular material selection policy with line outs. We have uh, some, I don't even know what to call them because it's not a policy from one trustee that was handed to us, suggestions I guess I have um, on it. I have no idea what the agenda is to, to discuss this and try to put together a policy. What is the plan for today? Uh, well, normally just people bring up something that they want to change or something that they want to discuss. And I think part of the confusion comes from the fact that you said that you, or the a trustee, um, or a 
actually maybe more than one trustee said that they did better seeing it in advance so they could look it over and digest it. Um, but now we're having complaints about there being a, a copy out there that was you know, had the suggested changes. Um, so, Trustee Blank. Um, I do not appreciate being blamed for acts for asking to have um, suggested changes in policies given to me um, uh, in a you know in a readable fashion. Um, we needed to know that. What I'm asking for today is so. Um, one of the things I see is on our table uh, that is um, that I that I had I'm so concerned about what's happening because I think that we're heading into some very very just ha having just heard the presentation on First Amendment I think we're heading into some very very challenging First Amendment areas with this policy with the suggestions that have made and even with the things that have been taken out of this policy um, the handout on this is four tests for a legally enforceable library policy, which I found on the internet um, that are that several states use. Um, but one of the things that says is that policies will be valid only if they no. It says what, uh, one of the things that is talked about is that policies are valid when they're written and when they're written out and. So to to try to discuss ideas without having them written is is insane. So I don't know if we are looking at this policy and trying to try our reg, our material selection policy and trying to take things out and put things in, or if we are simply taking these suggestions and trying to make that into a policy. Mr. Robinson. Okay, so uh, I said all of this, I won't probably say all of it, um, last meeting or last time we talked about this. Um, I I also am so confused on what all this is. And I was super confused when I opened my packet in the mail and I saw that it was on the agenda, but there was no policy in the packet. And I'm like, are we working off of the same thing that we saw last meeting? That made zero sense. So again, and I'm not, I'm honestly not trying to be difficult at all. It's just that I'm 100 percent confused because there is not a policy here. There's six, seven pieces of paper, seven pages of line through red, yellow, and random definitions that I don't really want in our policy. I think these people can look the definitions up and sell if they want to. Um, so I, I also, this 40 minute discussion is going to turn out the same way it did the last three meetings that we've looked at this because nobody knows what is, there's not a policy here. So I'm just 100% confused. We could save time and, and move this to a different meeting with an actual policy written up that we can look at. But nobody can tell me that this is something we can work off of. Um, I, I do find it a little bit confusing, but the, the uh, requested draft from a trustee was provided as several trustees asked for. Um, so perhaps, uh, Trustee Hanley, you could just start with a change that you would like to make from your draft that you provided. Okay, well, to help alleviate all this total confusion, um, there was a draft, insert, not a draft, there is a current policy in effect. I took that policy that was in effect and I made a bunch of suggested changes. I passed those out at the last meeting so that people would have a read ahead, which I like as well, to sit there and try and comprehend what changes someone's proposing, as opposed to just talking about it at this meeting. And so, and so that's what I did. So uh, I have a bunch of suggested changes on here to get started. And um, I guess I'm open to I, <laughs> criticisms on what you don't like as to the changes I suggested here. Trustee Robinson. 
This trustee definitely appreciates the effort. I see what you're saying, and I do appreciate that what you attempted to do here. Um, I think what people need to look at, though, is a mock-up of an actual material selection policy written out because the, all these thoughts and possibilities, I don't know where they're supposed to go into, what paragraphs are supposed to go in between of what they're supposed to replace. That's the confusion. So I do appreciate the effort and I understand what you're saying, uh, but it's not something clear for a trustee to look at as a policy and make decisions off of. And I, uh, Trustee Hanley? I would be more than happy to take this policy and put it in what I consider a final draft. And then you can, not you, but there are other trustees here can take shots at it. Because what I tried to do initially was take the existing policy and a meeting, several meetings back, uh, I believe the library director um, in, in her function as the secretary of the board uh, lined out a few things that we spoke about. I think there were some red lines added in there, rather red text. And then so I tried to stay with that theme and put my changes in there, additions and subtractions and leaving what was discussed uh, and people agreed to. And so that's why it looks good. And I agree, it does look confusing at this point. I think it's a very clumsy way to go about, I'll call it a major revision of a policy. So um, I'm open to the idea of rewriting this, actually assembling this policy into a finished product and presenting it in that capacity in that fashion if that helps. Because uh, to sit here and chew on one sentence at a time and move something around, so if we're going to do it that way, we need to put it up on a screen and edit it as a team, then print it out, take it home, think it over, bring it back, and and then vote on it or or change it or agree with it. So um, I, I find it almost impossible to sit here and write a document as, as a group of, of five people. So I try to take, again, what, we, what existed, the changes that were somewhat agreed to, and then made my own changes, keeping all the other stuff in there visible so we could see what was taken out, what's going in. So that's that's kind of how it evolved and turned into what it is at this moment. Um, I think it might be useful to discuss like a particular paragraph and then we could get consensus whether to or, uh, add that to the library's draft. Um, because otherwise it's just the whole thing all at once. I think we need to add it you know, have consensus on, you know, one paragraph or one section at a time. Uh, Trustee Foss? So this this is pretty clear to me. I think you're, I don't know why you're having so much trouble with confusion. The, this was in the last packet from the, uh, the 21st, September 21st. The previous old policy had yellow, had lined out items, and it had red. The red things in here are red. The lined out items are lined out in the previous. Basically, the unlined out black text is the way Rusty Hanley is proposing to do it. So you can see the history of it in his document. I don't think it's near as confusing as you're making it sound. What I would like to change, I can go straight to it, is uh, I think I can. Are you on the, the board draft or the Hanley draft? The Hanley draft. Okay. Um, I would like to add, I should have had it written here, but add where, where it quotes the Idaho law where it says harmful to uh, anyway, where it says in whole or in part or in that whole, I want to put back in the in part. And I, have, I think that's a couple places that it shows. We've shown where that. Oh, the after is oh, okay. over, I think it is. Let me start now. Page four or five in the yellow. Mine is actually in bold. Are you talking about the word in bold? Page four. Or in part. Could yeah. really but you had it a couple places. No, I had it in there. Okay, it's, it's actually not lined out. It's on page two. 
right under the definitions. Uh, the last sentence of the first paragraph under definitions, uh, where it's listing out this stuff, material or performance taken as a whole. I want to add the way it was lined out here as a whole or in part. Don't like this as a whole. I know the Idaho law says that, but there's nothing wrong with us having a policy that isn't word for word with the Idaho law. So add, taken as a whole or in part. Uh, um, my understanding of the taking as a whole comes from the criminal law aspects as Idaho statutes. We're not trying to decide whether someone is a criminal because a book as a whole is obscene. We're working on a policy to do with purchasing of books. And so it would be my understanding that I, I don't see any reason why we can say that a book, whether it's obscene as a whole or in part or a minor, should be uh, should not be purchased. And, and I'll add to that that we discriminate, we being libraries across the country, we discriminate on the purchases and the books we get every single day. Because if we didn't do that, we'd have a library the size of the Library of Congress. We don't have it in our budget. And so we are discriminating every single day as to what books we're purchasing in a library, our library here. Someone is, we have a book purchaser, and we're a board, we make policies, and I see no reason why we can't say Again, we're not. This is not a litmus test for for criminal law uh, for obscenity. This is a purchasing policy, and so it would be my opinion that I, I totally agree with what um, the other trustee put up. Thank you. Okay, right, Trustee Robinson. And uh, this goes with what Council was saying. I believe, uh, Council, you could tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, that if we added that back in, or in part, for acquisition acquiring books, that's completely different than using or in part for expelling books. Is that correct? Council? You say that one more time. I'm not yeah, sorry. Um, if we added taken as a whole or in part to the material selection policy, that's completely different than using that phrase to expel books is that correct if it's um, if it's idaho law or federal law or whatever that books are supposed to be taken as a whole or i don't know if law is the right word but it's just for purchase i know that's what, that's why I'm, that's why i'm making it clear i don't have a problem with that another, or in, another i'm sorry we... i'm sorry Jesse robinson has the floor <laughs> i don't have a problem with putting or in part in for the material selection policy, but it might end up being a problem for the getting rid of books is what I'm saying for the other the policy. Reading. Weeding, yeah. thank you. Reading. Yeah. Uh, Trustee Blank. Um, I would have asked these questions if this had come from the director. These changes are dramatic and they look like they're very specific to um, actually explicit books, I guess, is what I want to, and so it doesn't look like it. So my questions are not, they, these were, I began to ask these last time and was uh, not allowed to continue. Um, so I'm going to ask them again, where did this, the body of this policy come from? Was it did it come from a source? I would ask this of the director. Where did this policy come from? Because I would assume that the director would have looked at many other library policies, would have looked at, um, would have checked with, um, you know, library associations to make sure it's legal, would have looked through a lot of, so where did this one come from? Because this is very different than what we have. It says Hanley up at the top. That's I understand that. Where did this trustee get these ideas? Was there was there a, 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 a an organization that this trustee turned to that developed policy? Where did these come from? 
how did this format get put up? I mean, put it put together. It's okay, so actually what we're discussing right now is adding in the or in part, which was uh, Trustee Plus. I'm sorry, agenda. I that isn't on the agenda. I am asking this question. I would really like it answered. I would like to know where this came from. Trustee Plus. It's very clear to me, and the original okay. one that we have now, it's quoting Idaho Law 18-1517 and I've got the I didn't have here. It Mr. Just, Plus. I'm answering I because don't. they just took it word for word from the Idaho policy and put it in here. That's where I came Trustee from. Trustee Plus has four right now. Yeah. Okay, Trustee Blank. I would really like to request that you ask trustees to treat each other respectfully. I'm really tired of the tone of voice um, that comes across. It is really inappropriate. This is a very different policy. What were there other places consulted for this policy? That's what I need. I'd like to know. I mean, a trustee put it together. I would like that trustee to tell us where did this come from. Okay, so I, uh, Trustee Plus, had before after that because he was the one who raised his hand. It comes. It's word for word. Right out of here, I got the. It, he just put the uh, Idaho law into our policy. It's very clear. Okay. Trustee Blank, it is not word for word. I would like to know where some of this wording came from. I would like to know if there was a source used and what it is. It's exactly the question I would ask the director. Okay. Uh, Trustee Hammond. I didn't know it was being subpoenaed for information or there was a grant inquiry going on. This submission is my submission. Regardless of the sources, you like what you have here or you don't like what you have here. I, I do have a concern uh, in one area. If I understood legal uh, counsel properly, there might be a higher standard to be reached when it comes to removal of existing books. And as opposed to the acquisition of new purchases or acquisition of purchases. And so I'm just wondering, would it be proper for us, from a, because there's a higher standard in certain areas, that we have a different policy for the weeding process? I think I took that out of there, I forget. Yeah. Uh, and then have one for the uh, uh, you know acquisition or the uh, or I get the right word there the uh, anyway the purchase of new books. So I I, I was kind of curious uh, if council would tell me is it is it a good idea because it sounds as if it's a bigger deal if you remove a book from a library, but it may not be as big of an issue if you if you scrutinize more carefully what you purchase. Council. I don't think that the legal uh, analysis, I guess you would say, or the test for acquisition and removal are the same. And so my recommendation would be to tailor. We're talking about the outer boundaries of what's acceptable here, right? Not like my preference about your policy. I would make sure that you tailor what's in your policy inside those boundaries of the law. And those boundaries related to acquisition and removal don't entirely align, if that makes sense. And I do think it's fair to say that acquisition, you have more discretion to pick what you want to buy and display. And with removal, there's additional liability concerns that we went over today related to access to information, viewpoint, and content-based discrimination. So I think you have more room for acquisition, less room on removal. So I wouldn't, I could see instances where in, if your policy is towards the outer boundaries that they can't match and you would need to, but they need to be separate. That answers it. Thank you. Trustee Blank. So I'm assuming since I once again got no information on the sources that were used, that this came either from simply from one trustee <laughs> or that trustee has used sources that they do not want to disclose. And I am very, very concerned about that, that we would be developing a policy from sources that we don't understand. Um, I would also like to say 
that I will really quickly read you the four tests for a legally enforceable policy. Does the policy comply with current statutes? And I can see lots of reasons why this particular policy might not. Is the policy reasonable, including reasonable penalties? Could there be discriminatory act application of the policy? I'm sorry, point of order. And the last sorry. one is, is, is the policy point measurable? Trustee Blaine? I simply I wanted to order, which means that we need to stop and resolve the point. Of I order, simply wanted to finish. Right now we are on discussion of materials selection policy. Right. That's exactly what I was doing. Is the policy legally enforceable? This is four tests for a legally enforceable policy, right. and I was simply stating them. That's concerning this policy. Well, and we will have a legal review when we are done. I'm sorry, Trustee Fox, did you have something? It's not. The four points are just not something on the agenda. It's discussion of a legally enforceable policy, which we are talking about. Well, technically, it says to, or, uh, discussion of material selection policy. So that is what we are discussing right now. And, and things that are outside of the material selection policy are out of order. Trustee Robinson. Um, since the trustee that um, had such a um, heavy hand in writing this um, suggested that he is willing to actually write this up in a manner that we can actually look at and then maybe um, pick apart or or agree with. Um, I I would like to maybe try to get consensus that that happens because I really see us all sitting around this campfire again and then leaving with nothing of it again because we have been looking at these pages for quite a bit and we we don't move anywhere forward besides somebody else trying to change something else in these papers. And if trustee is willing to mock up a, a draft um, that we can actually um, digest, and I don't mean that as a as an insult, I just mean so we can actually look at it um, in order of how it would be written in the policy, because I do realize that some trustees for some reason say it all makes sense, but if it's not written as a policy, we can't really, you know, approve or or disapprove of it. So I would like if the trustee would actually um, draft it up as kind of like the like this one looks like, and then we can visit it. Okay. Yeah, and I didn't see it as heavy handed. I saw it as a response to several trustees asking for the changes in writing before the meeting. Oh, I meant heavy handed, like it was only his hand doing it. That's what I meant. Just like he wrote, no, he wrote this up. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Trustee Foss. I'd like to uh, move a motion to accept this policy with the change of or in part added on that paragraph on page two. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. So I don't think we need a motion for just a minor change in a draft, we can do that by consensus. So um, it's an action item to accept it. Where was yeah, well, you're not asking for to accept the entire policy. You're just asking no, for that one change. Let's vote on it. Oh, the whole policy? With, with that change. Um, I think it might be a, well, I mean, you're welcome to make the motion you just did. Um, so actually, I guess I should state the motion um, before I discuss it. Uh, would you, okay, so move to, move to accept, accept this material selection policy as presented with the change? Hold on. Uh, changes presented. Okay, so are you, you're talk, talking about a Hanley draft or? Yes. Okay. Uh, Hanley, uh, the changes presented in, is that the whole thing? Uh, under, under the, I can say which paragraph, but on page two, and the last sentence of the first paragraph under definitions, after whole, add, or in part. Where was it? I think it's a little bit random. Now, <laughs> well, I don't know if you need to say. Um how specific you need the change to be. Okay, well, we still need to uh, discuss the, the rest of it, but- um, You can discuss after and make the motion. 
What's that thing called where I can say call for a vote? Can we just call for a vote on this? Oh, uh, uh, call the question. Yeah. Or yeah. Or whatever it is. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you not get your? Did you not get it out yet? The motion. I think the motion needs to include the change. So I don't know whether you would just want to say accept the document with the change adding or in part um, under definitions. Or you could retract the motion and we could just by consensus add that part and then you could make a motion to accept the whole draft or not. Okay. I'll retract my motion. Okay, the motion has been retracted, and so now we would like to have consensus on adding the words or in part after the words taken as a whole on page two. Yes. Okay, so consensus, uh, Trustee Glass? Yes. I'm fine with that. No. Okay, Trustee Henley? So after the word, Cole, or in part? Uh, so it would read taken as a whole or in part. I'm okay with that. Yes. Okay, and I am too. So we have uh, four people in consensus to add the words or in part after it's taken as a whole on page two of the handy page. All right, uh, Trustee Blank. Um, I would just like to note that um, Idaho Code uses as a whole. Um, I, I'm quite concerned um, that this draft um, violates many pieces of Idaho Code. And to try to push it forward until that's addressed is really important. I don't think that this pol this is this draft that we're looking at isn't a full policy. Um, and also, I would like to know where is the director in this? This is a person with the absolute most library experience of any person in this room. And there has been no. Uh, Policies are always worked with with the director. It talks about that in the in the in the manual, um, and the, there is no there is there has been no discussion with the director concerning any of this. So where will will this will this draft be worked with with the director who has the most um, experience here? Um, I figured she would chime in when she. Um, and something to say. Do you want me to start talking now? Yes, I would love it. So let me just talk in general about policies. Um, I think it's important since we now seem to be focusing on this version that it has a title. It appears that maybe the title is Future Acquisition and Selection of Books Policy. It's unclear to me with the removal of leading and reconsideration. Is this intended to be a standalone policy? It's concerning to me that we might adopt a policy that's only based on acquisition and selection and that we don't have um, an in effect reconsideration or deselection policy at the same time. Um, typically policies are written in everyday language. And so in the very first paragraph that talks about well, public libraries, United States versus so case law citations are very rarely in a policy which is written for staff and the public. So I'm concerned about the readability of the policy as it's written. Um, the heading um, and the definitions. Um, again, if we are citing laws, then I think they should be cited in their entirety and or the citation referring people back to the full citation rather than just pulling out certain parts of the law, if that makes sense. So cite the law and send people back to the full law or cite the entire law, which would not be my preference. So um, again, for policy, um, it's not clear um, if it is the new materials selection policy, which deselection, or as we call weeding, is in library land a form of selection. We call it deselection, or slang is weeding. And so to present a policy that doesn't have reconsideration and doesn't have deselection at the same time is concerning. So 
I would like to see this in a little bit more traditional format with the title of the policy. So instead of referring it to Hanley's version, which I think we agreed we would stop calling trustees by trustees, right? You know, it's a it's a, it can be a valid version, but I think it needs to be labeled um, the way. Um, so those are just a couple of very basic thoughts. Um, the, the font size, the citations. Um, I'd like before the board took action on taken as a whole or in part, I would have really appreciated asking legal counsel, what, how does that change the interpretation of the statement? I think that's a valid point. And I think now we move forward and we're gonna mm -hmm. we come back to it. So we have him here, utilize him more fully, ask more questions as you go. So those are just some overall um, policy thoughts. Um, I will say that we have now spent several meetings on this topic. And generally speaking, the way that policies are created, the board articulates their goals, their objectives, the things that they want to see changed. And then the director, again, gathers information, revises the draft policy, and brings that to the board for their consideration. So, um, I mean, I'm willing to work with Mr. Handley and his version. He has a very specific idea to create a draft for the board, if that is what the board would like. But I'm concerned that we are spending a lot of time spinning our wheels and we're not getting and there's a lot of frustration. And so, again, this is not a typical policy for our public library. Um, it's very complex. It has case law. I'd like to put it in a more basic format that is more traditional with a library policy. I'm happy to take the input from Mr. Hanley, Trustee Hanley, um, and sit down with him and, and get what his goals or ideas or objectives were. Um, so I I thought that you said earlier that the, the proper order is to create things and then do the legal review afterwards. Um, and it, it seems like that would kind of spin our wheels more right now. It's three words. Um, that you can reject it if he thinks it's legally to do so. But perhaps uh, Trustee Hanley could do his draft and perhaps you could um, propose a weeding policy and uh, so I would just say that, you know, when the board is deciding to be more restrictive than the state statute, that I find that concerning. And again, it could be concerning relating to some of those other Idaho statutes that I did include in your packet relating to parents' rights. And um, so, so what I think the board just did is acted more restrictively than the Idaho statutes in that area. And so I'd like to know what legal implications that could have in our policy. I don't think that's an unfair question. And again, you can you can do what you are doing and you can continue down this path, but I just don't see it getting you very far. Hey, Trustee Allen. Um, I didn't expect the possibility of this draft uh, being accelerated to this rate. I'm not complaining, but I, I agree with one thing the director was saying, and I had that thought before she spoke, but if we pass this draft, we're gonna we're not going to have a weeding policy nor a reconsideration of material policy in effect. It would basically cancel that. It, it's not even addressed. So I kind of think we need to have two policies, one regarding weeding, and I have some ideas on weeding beyond what's on here and the reconsideration. But uh, I kind of think we need to deliver possibly both policies simultaneously. I guess Trustee, uh, I'm sorry, which one of you was first? She can go. Okay, okay. Trustee Blank. I am very concerned that anything that, that this draft is in conflict with Idaho code. So I appreciate the fact, I mean, I, I, I think, I think if you work with the director, we will be more effective in moving forward more quickly. Um, but it, it, it's got a lot of problems. And Trustee Robinson. Um, I actually did ask council about um, adding uh, or in part 
to the material selection policy. I did ask that question, and I totally appreciate that council uh, doesn't just answer right away. He tends to research a bit and answer, but a lot of times people's questions um, specifically to him um, get lost in the shuffle after they ask uh, because he's taking the time to look it up and he doesn't have a, an answer right away. The answer never gets to come out. And I, I did ask specifically if it's a if it's not that big of a deal for the selection policy to have that language, where is it maybe a big deal having the weeding policy have that language? So I did ask that very question. And like I said, he def council definitely answers when he's giving the opportunity to, but he usually takes a few minutes and maybe that needs to be something that is uh, looked at in the future for any trustee that has a question for him. Trustee Hanlon? I'd like to make a suggestion that I take name by name. The current draft has been put around at the different meetings. Um, clean it up, meaning take all the lines out in the different colors and, and separately, I'll have a separate one regarding weeding and reconsideration. And then I'd like to set, if that would be acceptable to the board, send those to the library director. The library director can clean those up and change them in whatever capacity she chooses. And at the next meeting, and that could be a special meeting if necessary, we have my draft that I submitted to the library director and the one she cleaned up. And then we can pick and choose and finalize it, maybe. But uh, it's, it's got, we have that some way of, of moving us along. And uh, it's not going to be an edited line by line where we started this process. So um, I'd be happy again to present a cleaned up draft of what I have without all the colors and lines and highlighting. And I'll have another version with the weeding and reconsideration. I could submit those to the library director and then the library director could present her version of my draft if that would work. Um, so just a thought. Sounds good to me. We have a consensus on that. Sure. I guess, um, could it possibly be um, done on the uh, material selection policy dated 11 22? Could you show the changes that you're looking for on the existing policy? That's why it's so confusing now. Yeah, that's he, what it's true. He, he said that he would. Yeah. Do well, that. no, I mean, a one time. A one time draft instead of six pages worth. I think don't we have that is that version because what we typically do with the policy is we literally look at what's being replaced directly or added to directly. So. It is. It, either way, it doesn't matter. We just need something better to work with. So if you're that's fine, whatever you're going to do. Sure. Uh, Trustee Klaus. I'd like to just move ahead with it so we get a policy, and get it in place and get this taken care of so the library is not buying books that violate this. Instead of going on month after month of fighting with all of this, we can still change the policy in a month or two later if we had to. Yeah, but it's too messy. Sorry. I'm not sure that this is a complete policy, so I like the idea of him reworking it and working with the director and presenting the whole thing in a more basic format that makes sense. Um, I think that working on this policy carefully is really important because this it makes us very lawsuit vulnerable if we are not careful. OK, so our time is up for that section. We will move on to the director evaluation policy. Oh, that's true. Uh, yes, that is you. Okay, I'm on the committee for creating the performance evaluations, not, not the, the, the policy and the one that will be used for the library director because to, to my knowledge, there is no policy. So I did complete my research, just I brought it just so you can see I really did. These aren't blank pages. I went and did a lot of homework, looking things up on the internet, and I pulled up evaluation. Uh, processes and forms that are used at other libraries, other library systems. 
Um, I looked at also the Idaho Commission for Libraries and the right at ALA and um, to see what what different um, ways the um, library directors are evaluated. So I did, um, let me see here, I did complete a draft. I'm not going to present it today, but I have a two page policy uh, right here. It's got a few holes in it, meaning a few little fill ins of things I don't have answers for yet. And so that's where I am with that. Uh, my next step is to work on the form that is to be used uh, for the performance evaluation. Um, and I would ask, um, I guess we need a consensus. I would like to have a copy of the form that is used currently by the library for the staff as a whole. And if there is a, an evaluation form for the library director that, that exists somewhere, it's not referred to anywhere else on the um, in our policies nor on our internet of the CLN. I would like a copy of what what is in existence now. I, I don't want to recreate the wheel, reinvent the wheel. Um, doesn't mean I'm going to take it as is, but um, I would like to know if there is a form or is it just a blank piece of paper that people write on? And so I, I, I would like if it's OK and if it's I get against. And so and I finally on my my report here, not to my final two things, I would like to meet after I get this draft a little. I have again a few holes in it, not much at all. It's just about finished. Um, then I'll meet with um, Trustee Plus since we're a committee and then finally uh, present our draft to the board. And I think that there's high likelihood a draft and a form could be delivered next month at the regular meeting unless someone chooses to have one sooner than that. But I, I would like and ask for consensus to have a form uh, provided to me or two forms, one for the library director that was used in the past, and one is used for staff now. I agree with that. I do. Okay, uh, Mr. Blank, is that, that there's no there's some there's something is that appropriate or I mean Blank. that's no no I'm sorry no I was looking at her oh not still there that that's is our evaluation forms for staff. Available to us. Uh, we do have a blank um, staff um, evaluation form. Um, I'm not certain about what forms or what mechanisms for the previous library directors. Um, I can review and maybe redact some things. Okay. okay. And I know that this would have been uh, useful before I just came across it yesterday, and maybe you said that you already did this uh, in the trustee manual. Um, and on, on page 122 to 123, it talks about director evaluations. And on 123, I think it had several links to appraisal forms. So it's oh. 122 to 123. I think there, I think there may be even more pages on that because I was looking in the manual as well, and I think that there may be a considerable number of pages on um, evaluating, a, you know. Director performance. Okay, yeah, it's like yeah, okay. yeah. Thank I just you. happened to come across that yesterday. So there's, um, and I have requested with ICFL that they put an index in there so that we can find all the pages that relate to uh, having been that's probably a couple of years in the making. Uh, I, thought they, I thought they had, an, they have a table of contents. Yeah, but it's great. Um, so if there are meetings, um, I think it would be, I was going to ask about that. Have there been meetings? Because I certainly haven't heard of any. So I would just like to remind uh, the committee that um, they need to be open meetings so that those of us who wish to can attend. Um, and I really appreciate hearing about the things you've looked at. But at this point in time, what I'm understanding, it has just been worked on by one person. Um, and it hasn't, uh, okay. And it hasn't been looked at with the director who would be a resource in terms of uh, looking at other libraries and someone who has worked in and been evaluated by other libraries. That might be a good resource. Okay, uh, Trustee Hammond. Uh, I'm open and accepting all sources of, of forms or policies that existed. I did my best to do reasonable research. So if the library director has something from other places or past, I'm more than happy to receive those. Um, the more information, the better. Um, 
I, I'm not going to get stuck in an analysis paralysis mode where I study this forever. I, I did a reasonably good search. I think I have a fairly decent policy. And um, it is our job as a board to make the policy. So I don't necessarily need the library director to tell me what like what what policy how to write it, but I am open to suggestions uh, once I present my product. I'm more than happy to uh, take I'm not going to take it personally, that criticism and chop on the thing if there's something wrong with it. Ones we're debating issues and not uh, personalities, trust class. So I'm I'm on the committee, but I have told Trustee Hanley just he's got three years as personnel HR manager, and I've just been an engineer. Just go do what you can, and then then we'll be. So I don't even know what he's got there. And the director, he's just going to remind the board that they utilize the professional services of June Garcia, and um, she has um, previous history about working with the board on onboarding new directors and evaluations and, and all of that information, that would probably be, would have been where I would have started. She could have helped collate um, examples across the nation and she really is the expert that we have access to. Um, I would maybe suggest to the um, committee members that we have either a brief phone call uh, with Garcia um, to kind of recap some of the work that she's already done for the district. Um, as a as a as a valuable insight um, in moving forward. Okay, and that would not be an extra cost. She would probably have a short conversation or email or or something of that nature um, without cost. Um, again, I think I don't know what her hourly rate is. Maybe some of the former trustees would know, but I think. Um, you know, the role of the trustees is really not, they're already volunteers. And so utilizing, let's just say an hour at $100 is probably a very good use of uh, resources on behalf. It is work of the district um, and could be a great professional support for trustees. Um, I know there's been some discussion about what the job description of the trustee is, what the job description of the library director. So I think she could provide some valuable insight in what trustee or what directors are evaluated on the typical or standard um, for um, the industry, some of those other insights that they may not be aware of. Uh, trustee Klaus? I, I was just hoping to back up to the beginning of who is June Garcia or June. Yeah. What, what is our experience with her? Yeah. My understanding, she was using, I think, the hiring process. Let me, I, I can answer. I can answer really. Someone else has an answer. Yeah, because um, I was involved. She was um, our um, hiring person for two of our directors. We also used her for policy development. She is, um, she is a consultant. Um, for libraries and has been that for at least 30 years and was a director of libraries before that. She's extremely well um, knowledgeable about public libraries and wrote a book on uh, writing policies for the library. She would be invaluable in asking and very inexpensive. Trustee Robinson? And I'll add that I found her to be uh, very unbiased as well. Uh, when we were looking for a director, um, she she was very, uh, that's all I can say, she was very unbiased as a, um, a professional. And I think that she would be valuable as well for, for you guys or for um, one trustee to, to speak with her. Um, I think you'll find her uh, very helpful. And um, yeah, I would agree with what Trustee Robinson said. Never heard of her. <laughs> if, if I could get the contact information, uh, maybe from the director, okay. maybe an email if that, that's good for you. Um, contact, either, either an email for June Garcia and or a phone number. All right. There is no further discussion. We will move on to the next session, uh, which is discussion of future agenda requests. Uh, Trustee Blank. Um, I. Uh, would like to ask that we have a less crammed agenda. Um, we limit discussion because of that, and I think that that is detrimental to the library. 
Um, in the discussion of um, on this trustees continuing education um, 92123, which I had referred to before, it talks about the agenda and the trustee manual, and it has a quote in it. It says, Chair plans the meetings carefully when, where, why, what. He or she solicits input from the library's director to prepare a timed agenda in advance. But the rest of the sentence was not added, and I think it's very important. And the rest of the sentence says, so, so it's prepared a timed agenda in advance, allowing adequate time for the items listed. I feel like we are getting, we have some very important and heavy duty things and it gets, the agenda gets so packed that it, that discussion becomes completely limited. So my request is that we, that we are more careful about what we put on the agenda and more um, realistic about allowing discussion time. Uh, Trustee Henley. Thank you. Thank you for a minute. Um, I, I have three items for the next next one of these other meetings. Uh, one is the um, is to the, the uh, library director performance evaluation policy. I'll bring it so you can write it down. The other one is the material selection policy. And the last one will be the weeding and what was the last part I dropped out of that policy? Sorry. That's going to be and reconsideration. Yes, policy. That's all. I guess I don't want Okay, uh, Trustee Boss. I have two things I request. Um, one is to add an agenda item. I hate to get into it, but to I think it's to change our bylaws. We can write a policy, but I want to add rules for how to revise a policy. Of our, the bylaws are what we work with. We don't write policies to manage ourselves, so it's the bylaws, I think. Maybe Lickle can tell me, but it would be, the agenda item would be to Initiate changes to the bylaws to add rules for changing policies. And, and the second one is I think I want a special meeting. We've got a whole issue that I couldn't talk about today, but uh, continuing the insurance quote process. And I think we're in a bigger hurry than waiting a month. So I would like a special meeting. Continuing the insurance quote process because we all know Redmond presented an opportunity on the 6th to do this. And I don't know if the library director can tell us what's going on, but we we need to discuss this. Okay, um, I think because the materials policy is taking such a long time um, that we should have a special meeting that is mostly dedicated just to that um, before our November meeting. Um, and but it could also include uh, the insurance quote process and uh, material, uh, the weeding and reconsideration things. Um, do we have consensus on that being a, a special meeting? Trustee Blank? I think that you are cramming in and not allowing time for discussion. I think that there's, I mean, the material selection policy and a weeding policy and a reconsideration policy would easily take up two hours. And um, then to try to talk about insurance, which is a, a challenging one as well. I think once again, you are cramming it in and there will not be a time for adequate discussion if you do it in one meeting. Um, well, otherwise it's going to take 10 more years, um, but anyway, sorry, Trustee Robinson. Yeah, I was just going to point out the, it's almost funny, um, but one trustee said about the agenda and then literally, um, two trustees after that adding, you know, like saying they want all the stuff on the agenda. So I, all are valuable for sure, <laughs> but, um, I do want to point out just today, um, Council was cut off on his presentation 
thankfully he got to finish, but that's why the agendas can't be crowded because there's very important things like what council said today and to cut him off just because his 10 minutes is up would have been just harmful for everybody that came here today. Um, council's here at every meeting. He doesn't actually talk a lot. Like, like I said before, sometimes questions are asked and he doesn't get an opportunity to answer that because he's looking them up and then he was going to be cut off. So again, one trustee says we need to put less on the agenda because of this reason. If we don't get to, sometimes we're limited to two minutes each. And then the next two have all these things they want to add. So again, all are valuable, but we there has to be time to discuss each and everything and maybe get something done instead of, hey, we're out of time, now we're on to the next, but we didn't actually get anything done. Well, that's, yeah, I, I think a, a Stephanie would be good for that because then we wouldn't have the other regular business items, um, but it is 5.30 and we need, to, uh, if we're going to schedule this, we need a motion to extend the meeting. I'll move, I'll move to extend the meeting five minutes. It has been moved to extend the meeting five minutes. All those no. in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Me. Okay, the ayes have it and the, the motion to extend the meeting five minutes uh, is carried. No, just I would just express one concern about talking about insurance, and that was that I had slated for the further discussion um, in November at the regular meeting about our line item and our budget. We currently do not have any funds um, to dedicate towards insurance. Okay, well, we can discuss it. So, um, so do we have consensus on a three-hour special meeting that would include uh, the material selection policy, the weighting and reconsideration, uh, and the insurance quote process? Yes. Sure, yes. Okay, so that's four. We have consensus. We will be scheduling a special meeting, and it would be uh, easier than hurting cats later if we all looked at our schedules right now. And please give the trustees that are supposedly working on this enough time before the meeting. Okay, so maybe like a week before the meeting? Two weeks. Oh, a week before our next meeting? Okay, so our next meeting is November 16th. Yes. So, yeah. uh, um, so would the insurance discussion only take place after we hear what the results are from ICRIM, from our appeal with ICRIM? No. Oh, okay. Yes. That's the best. No, I think we need to have a special meeting in maybe a week. Because there's something going on, why we aren't getting the insurance quotes when they're ask, asking for information. And I think it can be a short meeting and maybe whatever we can do, it could be a two hour meeting and whatever we can do with the material selection policy, fill that in the rest. But I don't want to, we don't need, we should not be waiting for this. We, we don't have full insurance coverage right now. Um. Okay, but scheduling a whole bunch of uh, special meetings is problematic. Mm -hmm. I, I bet. So, like maybe in two weeks, we'll. That's fine. To come. Okay, so in about two weeks yeah. from now. Okay, so around November 2nd. <clears throat> How does Thursday sound for everybody? November 2nd. That's fine after, after in, in the afternoon. Yeah, I can do this. Okay. Uh, two to five? Is that what we're looking at? Two to five? Uh, that works for me. If, if that should be found. We'll find okay. All right. Two to five, November 2nd, uh, to discuss those uh, three or four uh, insurance quotes, process, or, uh, progress, process, meaning reconsideration policies, material selection policy. Um, Okay, is that everything on that one? Yes, I will move to adjourn. Okay, it has been moved to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, we are adjourned. And I gotta run everybody, so hey. Was I'm off of another party. Another party. Another party. Another party. Bye, everybody.